Hello, everyone. Second day of CLRC's conference, and we start with uh, panel four, uh, language, power, and politics in Georgia. Uh, this is very exciting panel with uh, diverse research methods, a little bit non-traditional methods, at least for CRRC used in some of those papers. We will have three presenters for the panel. Our colleague, David Sicinawa, CRRC's research director, will present echoes of 44-day war in Nagorno-Karabakh in Georgian social media. And that will be followed by Lucas Faliano, now independent researcher and former CRRC affiliate. Greetings, Lucas. Happy to see you here. And he will be present how, to, how we speak, who hears us, the data analysis of Georgian PM's Twitter network and uh, discourse. Very timely and very uh, interesting topic right now as uh, PMs continue doing these things even these days. And let's see what, what uh, Lucas found from their previous communication with the um, Twitter audience. And then um, the presentation by Maria Mosiashvili from Central European University, official um, state language acquisition as a boundary crossing experiences of young Georgian Azerbaijanis. Um, Let's hear these three presentations just to remind you about the rules, 15 minutes for each presenter and then 15 minutes for discussion combined. So if you have questions during uh, first and second presentations, please either type it up or uh, remember and then ask during the question and answer sessions. Again, who is watching us on Facebook or uh, YouTube, they can also type questions there and then our colleagues will uh, communicate that to presenters. Uh, okay, let's start. David, the floor is yours. Uh, Koba, thank you so much. Let me quickly uh, share my screen. Uh, uh, so first of all, uh, yeah, uh, before kind of we resolve this uh, small uh, technical hiccup, yeah, I'd like to, uh, 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 so uh, my presentation, first of all, I usually start with the caveat that uh, uh, my presentation from the methodological point of view will be kind of both include like human coded data and non-human coded data. So I would like to um, uh, thank, um, our uh, social media monitors who did a lot of work in order to kind of make the uh, make this project happen and uh, uh, basically uh, kind of spent a lot of time in in in, uh, in going through the social media data and basically uh, coding. Okay, so here we go. Um, uh, this presentation, first of all, uh, thanks so much for. Uh, uh, tuning in uh, and uh, this presentation, which uh, uh, is a basically a presentation of a report that we produced uh, within uh, at CRC Georgia, uh, and uh, it sort of uh, deviates from the traditional, let's say, academic presentation because it doesn't really involve too much theory um, per se, but it uh, aims at understanding. Uh, uh, the key mapping and understanding key narratives uh, in Georgia social media with regard to the 44 day war uh, in Nagorno Karabakh. And what is the plus side of this research is that it looks not only the Georgian language uh, social media, as well as Georgia's Armenian and Azerbaijani communities. Uh, so this study was conducted. Uh, um, uh, basically during the uh, last year and uh, early this year when we kind of uh, uh, synthesized our results, but the time period that covers it's just a couple of months before uh, the 2020 war in Nagorno-Karabakh and a few months after. Basically, it's a one-year time period starting from the um, early June of 2020 uh, uh, to the uh, June 2021, so it covers uh, before, kind of significant amount before and after times. 
Uh, so basically we aimed to answer the following research questions throughout this uh, research project. So what is the representation uh, of the Nagorno-Karabakh war in Georgian social media and under Georgia, meaning uh, Georgia as a territory, not Georgian as a language per se. Uh, secondly, we also look at what were the uh, critical narratives that are used to frame the conflict uh, in relation to, Ge to, to Georgia. Uh, second, uh, thirdly, we looked at how foreign actors such as Russia and Turkey are characterized in these discussions. And finally, how Georgia's Armenian and Azerbaijani communities discuss the conflict. So we could not, uh, uh, com uh, could not uh, complement this study with uh, public opinion data. That would have been great. But uh, I think and we believe that the social media analysis still provides a lot of uh, context to the situation, uh, to, to the analysis of how folks in Georgia perceive the conflict. So methodology, um, uh, as for the methodology, we uh, analyzed about 10,000 uh, crowdsourced posts in Armenian, Azerbaijan, and Georgian languages. Uh, we have access to CrowdTangle, which is a social media listening and monitoring tool by Meta, formerly known as Facebook. Um, and uh, for the Georgian language uh, posts, we used keywords to search, while for Armenian and Azerbaijan, we complemented, um, uh, we basically harvested, uh, we crowdsourced the key uh, community Facebook pages that uh, discuss these topics, uh, given that it is a challenge to kind of limit geographically uh, the search. So therefore, we had the list of crowdsourced uh, community pages uh, in Armenia and Azerbaijan, and we harvested this data. It involved manual monitoring, given the relatively smaller say, size of the data set. We had four media monitors, four media analysts, uh, two of Georgian native Georgian speakers, one Armenian and one Azerbaijani native speaker. And as for the automated uh, methods, we used the topic modeling on machine translated data, and we also did some sentiment analysis with this. So I would like to mention that it was funded uh, through the uh, uh, by the uh, within the framework of the peace building through capacity enhancement and civil society engagement project, a peace to project, um, and uh, CRC uh, Azerbaijan in EPF Azerbaijan are. Lead partners in this program, and we, CERS Georgia, were responsible for the research component. So, first, start with the dynamics of the Nagorno Karabakh mentioning the conflict in Georgia social media. Um, as you can see, we identified about 10,000 Facebook posts for monitoring, which was about 9.5 thousand in Georgian, uh, about 500 in Armenia, and about 1,000 in Azerbaijan. So, we see the two significant uh, uh, peaks that coincide with the start of hostilities, as well as uh, a Russia brokered ceasefire, which happened like respectively in September 27th and November 9th, 2020. Uh, when it comes to uh, uh, Armenian and Azerbaijani social media segments, uh, we can see uh, basically uh, the peak is associated with the start of hostilities in late September in the Armenian language social media. And when it comes to Azerbaijani social media, post frequencies peak at uh, uh, the start and the end of hostilities, I mean, the official start in the say so. Um, we also use this following metric called interaction. Um, uh, and in interaction, uh, it basically measures how many uh, likes, uh, shares, comments, uh, were collected by a, by a particular uh, Facebook post. Uh, here, again, there are uh, peaks that would have been expected, like start of hostilities um, and the ceasefire. But what is really interesting is that the Georgia segment also peaked uh, uh, when the Azerbaijan government uh, um, create, uh, opened up the um, uh, trophy park in April 2021. What are the themes that are discussed uh, uh, by the social media uh, pages? So uh, we did manual monitoring to do those. And uh, mostly, as you can see here, uh, the ball all in all languages, um, um, uh, 
and in, in all kind of uh, uh, foreign policy uh, uh, by foreign policy actors. When we mention these foreign policy actors, um, uh, most frequently they mention the leaders of the um, 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 leaders of the kind of Armenia, the Azerbaijan, Pashinin uh, and as well as words such as peace, uh, agreement, and ceasefire were also commonly mentioned. And Georgia is also widely mentioned in all four instances. So, which means that uh, basically it. Uh, uh, indicates that posts highly likely discussed these topics in relation to Georgia. So uh, with the specific language of posts here, we can see that the languages of the Armenian and Azerbaijan language posts are different. Um, when it comes to uh, Armenian language posts, uh, we see that uh, 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 many of the posts discuss this conflict from the regional perspective, from the region of, ja of Javaheti region, while in Azerbaijan, words are less diverse, as we can see, and they most probably discuss the military confrontation. Um, so when it comes to Georgia language po uh, portion of posts, which is the majority of analyzed posts, keywords are relatively neutral, and they discuss statements from the uh, from the leaders from each of the sides and that is also described ceasefire and they also uh, describe perhaps russian peacekeeping operations and fewer mentioned georgia so we also did sentiment analysis uh, sentiment analysis is a special technique that uh, kind of helps us understand uh, uh, where what are the kind of uh, uh, how the whether the discuss whether uh, posts are positive, neutral, and negative. It's just kind of uh, uh, one of the ways of uh, quantifying uh, the sentiment uh, in, a, in, a, in an analyzed text. So we used the so-called affin uh, uh, model to, uh, to discuss, uh, to kind of characterize sentiments. So we can see that uh, mostly <clears throat> uh, sentiments are distributed evenly and tend to be neutral but negative sentiments uh, are associated with the war events as well as start of the hostilities and violent moments in the war as well as um, uh, with anti-governmental protests in Armenia. Uh, if we look at the post-level sentiments, that's also perhaps mostly uh, neutral. And we can see that social media users in Georgia, uh, social media pages in Georgia kind of use neutral language. Um, so we can see that there is a like the both Azerbaijan language uh, uh, posts are relatively kind of neutral, uh, while Armenian and the Georgian language posts have kind of certain spikes in the sentiment distributions. Let's look at uh, the mentions of the uh, foreign policy actors. Uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia are most frequently mentioned, followed by Russia and the Nagorno-Karabakh authorities. Fewer mention Georgia, which is interesting. Um, um, interestingly, also, um, almost all mentioned actors uh, are discussed in a neutral manner, perhaps with the exception of uh, uh, Turkey, um, uh, which has the kind of highest share of uh, negative context mentions. Uh, if we look at the language distribution, uh, uh, so we can also see a very similar pattern, uh, Azerbaij in Azerbaijani language, uh, 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 let's say European Union, Turkey, and the, uh, Georgia are described in the kind of positive, uh, more likely to be positively discussed. While in Armenian language posts, Azerbaijan and Turkey are discussed in a very negative, in a, in a negative context. So uh, we can see the dynamics, temporal dynamics, how uh, things have developed over time. Uh, and as you can see here. Uh, while Armenia and Azerbaijan are most frequently mentioned, these mentions are mostly very neutral uh, based on the, uh, the data, based on the coded data from our monitors. We also looked at the presence of hate speech, uh, uh, but and we tried to measure hate speech uh, using the methodology developed by UNESCO's Handbook of Online Hate Speech, but. Uh, Interestingly for me, uh, what we found is that there is not much hate speech. Basically, there is almost no hate speech used on uh, in those 10,000 posts. Only 33 
About 43 posts contained hate speech against Azerbaijan, one or another form. Only 33 uh, contained uh, hate speech towards Armenia. So, which is basically very, very few, especially in online discussions. Um, and uh, while there is a minuscule share of uh, such uh, instances, uh, most of the hate speech instances were happening uh, at the beginning of hostilities. Um, so we still analyze the typology based on UNESCO um, uh, method got developed by, uh, by UNESCO, so which kind of suggests uh, uh, different categorization of hostilities. Again, uh, given the very small number of hate speech instances, uh, still these these numbers do not make much uh, much sense. But still, we can see that. Uh, uh there are some instances of uh, kind of inciting kind of calling to incite violence calling to, for hostilities against a specific uh foreign policy actor uh and so on and so forth but again this is very 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 small number <clears throat> and finally uh, uh let's touch upon the topics of peace and reconciliation um so our analysts actually um uh, uh, defined that about 5% of these all analyzed posts, about almost close to 500, called for reconciliation. Um, uh, so uh, about 11% of Azerbaijani language posts call for reconciliation, about 5% uh, uh, of the Georgian call, uh, posts are so called for reconciliation. Only 1% in Armenian language Facebook posts call for reconciliation. So if you look at the um, uh, speech bubble or like word cloud uh, visualization, so two primary keywords uh, uh, emerge as uh, um, in these. So this region, peace, followed by politics, stability, and diplomacy, and keywords indicate perhaps hint to the fact that conflict in these posts are understood in the regional context, while peace and stability in this context is uh, very crucial. And if we look at the more fine grain uh, kind of topic modeling, we can see that there are uh, three major, major topics. So we did like a small level topic modeling and now extended this uh, topic modeling. So uh, we can group one group, which highlights the importance of peace, and another group of things is concerned with the political aspect of the conflict. And uh, finally, the third stream of topics is uh, can be grouped on the humanitarian and economic aspects of reconciliation. Uh, so yeah, that was basically the results of our research. We can see that the conflict had been discussed in a very neutral manner uh, in the Georgian uh, language uh, social media, notwithstanding the language of the social media posts. Uh, but, um, uh, and of course, this affected very much in jo to Georgia's Armenian and Azerbaijani communities. But what is really significant for us is that the social media indicates that still uh, uh, Georgia's Armenian and Azerbaijani communities looked at the conflict from the regional uh, perspective, as well as uh, also indicates that uh, um, um, we can see that uh, uh, people were. Uh, perceive the importance of peace. Thank you so much. And I hope I didn't go too, uh, uh, too long in my presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Dato. And now, Lucas, please, uh, 15 yep. minutes for your presentation. And then uh, Maria will take over. OK. Hopefully, everybody can see it. Yeah. I think you should. Okay, so hello everybody, thank you for being here. My name is Lucas, as um, Koba, Koba said, I used to be in CRC as an international fellow. Now I'm a data literacy officer at ACLET. And what I'm going to be presenting right now is research that I did while I was an international fellow at CRC. So I think, first of all, I want to say thank you to CRC for allowing me to be here, but also for helping me to do most of this research, especially that. Um, so what is it that I'm going to speak in today? I'm going to be speaking about the, the, an initial data exploration of Georgian digital communications in Twitter. What I'm going to try to see is how is it that we utilize Twitter, who is it that we're trying to utilize Twitter with, and some future research that maybe we can do related to this. Instant, 
in terms of my content, so uh, this presentation first, I'm gonna go a little bit over the context of my research question. Then I'm gonna go over the methods that I use, my findings, and lastly, I'm gonna go over my conclusion. So in terms of the context, one of the first things that we can see is that there is a trend in political communications. So political communications and diplomacy are moving towards Twitter and digital spaces more and more. It's not necessarily that they are overtaking traditional spaces, but they are moving towards at least having discussions in these digital spaces. It's, it's enough to see what happened in the US with the last administration and how Twitter became a thing for political communications. But I think a much more relevant uh, development for us is the fact that most of the commission right now, the EU Commission, Council, the entire EU system is on Twitter. And they utilize Twitter in a particular way, in a very in a very particular way of spreading messages and ideas, not only things that are happening. They're still spreading news and things about themselves, like literature has suggested, but they try to also put their ideas, policy, uh, policy relevant um, developments and so on. In the case of, of Georgia, however, Facebook still dominates us. We are, we, in Georgia, we have a lot of usage in Facebook and naturally that also reflects to how do we use political communications. Political communications in Facebook in Georgia is not an uncommon thing. We have a lot of work being done on that, especially when it comes to this information, for example. The other thing that we can see is that there's a worrisome discourse appearing in the last years. And this is where utilizing these spaces of digital spaces can become useful because we can get further insight by analyzing how is it that we utilize them. Um, at the same time, there are in academia, there have been like growing efforts to analyze social media and EU studies, especially how uh, parliamentarians, prime ministers try to utilize social media and why do they use it for? So most, most of the time we have seen, for example, that uh, MAPs are utilizing Twitter sometimes to reinforce party ideas, but sometimes to not only substitute, but also clash against dom domestic party ideas. We can see similar um, similar research being done about how embassies are starting to now connect through Twitter as well. I'm doing separate research from this from now, right, from this one now, and I can see that during the war, Russian embassies have been very active on, on trying to do public diplomacy and of course, also this information campaigns because of social media, and they can do it because of that. Now, whenever and whenever we are speaking about social media, there's a lot of computational effort required, and we have the other advantage that there is a lot of methods coming almost every day. So that means that we have we are in a perfect position to start analyzing social media much more efficiently. However, in the case of Georgia, social media is almost entirely uncharted territory when it doesn't come to Facebook. So that's the reason why I try to first go for Twitter because trying to understand something that we often don't speak about. So my research question, my first research question was how Georgian prime minister utilized Twitter. And I did the research question as broad as possible on purpose because I was trying to do this data exploration and try to understand what is it there. From here, I got to other two questions of are there any discernible patterns in the use of Twitter by prime ministers? So I'm trying to see if there is any difference then who listens to us in, in Twitter. So for the data collection, I rely mostly on my on Twitter API. I utilize different programming languages to take out data from here and process it. Um, to be to be quite blunt, the amount of tweets that we got is not really comparative to the size that normal Twitter data collection implies. I have, as I say, I have a project right now has more than three hundred thousand tweets, whereas this one has only one thousand four hundred sixty-five. That also speaks volumes about how do we utilize Twitter and how much do we actually utilize Twitter. In terms of my time frame, I, it starts in 2016, ends in 2022, and ends in January of 2022. So by my for my data set, the war did not happen. So there's a lot of things that change after that. In terms of my subject of analysis, I utilize Karibashvili, Gakaria, Baktasi, and Kirikashvili. And that's because I, would, I tried to cover all of the prime ministers that I could find on Twitter. So if you would have been, if there would have been someone before that, that was using Twitter during their time because oh, this in in the data set, I only include tweets that they used during that time. So for example, Gakaria right now is a political figure because he's an opposition leader. His tweets of opposition leader do not come, only come the ones that he was using as a prime minister because that's what I'm interested in. In terms of my me methods, my main me methodology was utilizing quantitative text analysis. I take a very, little bit different approach to what that did of utilizing crowdsourcing and utilizing more mixed methodologies. I went almost entirely into the quantitative side. So I tried to do three things. So the first thing is doing a keyword analysis. What I'm trying to do here is quantitatively find relevant words for a given target. So which words are more relevant or are more uh, descriptive of a certain person? And I do that by seeing which words are more nor are more possible to appear in one uh, person's documents over another one. 
The second thing that I tried to do was to do an structural topic modeling. This is an unsupervised topic modeling, which allows me to include also docu document um, the metadata, metadata. So I can here do some a little bit, I can do some more manipulation around these topics. What is the topic modeling? So topic modeling is a clustering method to find topics between documents. So basically I'm telling the computer, find me clusters of words, which that's what we are gonna call topics. This produces very interpretative results because it's it's the job of the researcher to go through these clusters and identify which one is an actual topic and which one doesn't make sense because we are not using semantics here. We are just using the presence of words in these documents. Finally, I use ELISA semi-supervised topic modeling a technique to validate and to also like bring a little more strength to a structural topic modeling. What the semi-supervised topic modeling does is that instead of just telling the computer, he, please find me six clusters. I'm telling, please find me six clusters, but consider that these words are more representative of this or that cluster. So for example, NATO is gonna be on the foreign policy. And if you're gonna be speaking about IMF, most probably it's gonna be speaking about economics. If you are speaking about elections, most probably it's gonna be politics. So we have to do these connections on which are the keywords. What is more uh, relevant for the semi-supervised topic modeling is that allows us to see which topics actually make sense and actually are representative in my data. Then I did a network analysis where I tried to include two things. Uh, um, first, Garibashvili's uh, ego network and then the actor network. As we are going to see later, it was the actor network which actually brings more. The actor network shows all the replies, mentioned quotes and retweets done by the actor uh, towards other people. So because of problems in the Twitter API limitations, which are actually quite heavy, we cannot get all of the mentions that somebody mentioned Garibashvili, especially because there is a lot of things, but, uh, but at least we can get every time that they wanted to mention somebody. So we can see how they try to interact with other members of social media. So the initial findings. So the first thing that we can see in, in our data set is that there's a very low usage of Twitter across all of the accounts. So we start in total with around 70 tweets per month in the case of Kirigashili, and then we go progressively downwards to the point that we are right now at around, 20, uh, around 10 tweets per month. And we are always staying in this gap between 20 and 10. It's always up and downs, but we're always staying there. That at least shows us there is a coordinated use of Twitter instead of at least use it. Not necessarily, we are not using, we are not trying to be influencers in, tu in Twitter, we are not trying to be von der Leins or Joseph Borrell's, but we are at least trying to use it enough not to die. Um, and the other more relevant thing I, did, I think it is, is the audience. And it's the fact that by doing just a very rough analysis over the language utilized in Twitter, we can see that the audience that is intended to be with Twitter is supposed to be foreign. A very striking difference with our international partners, which mix up languages. For example, I was checking Moldova because of all the things that have been, have been going on, and they mix language a lot between German, French. If they spoke with France, they were speaking in French. Or if they had to say something relevant to France, they would also put it in France. Georgia doesn't do that. Georgia does it only in English. More surprising, and for me, or even more funny, there are more tweets in Spanish than there are in Georgian. So that this shows me that Georgian must not be their audiences when, a, when a more than 50% of the population doesn't really have basic knowledge of, of English. So at least we know here that, what, how is it they're trying to speak in like which language and who is the audience. Going to my quantitative text analysis results. So the first thing that I found was when doing frequency analysis, which most of the time we don't really utilize for doing a lot of analysis when it comes to quantitative text analysis. Frequencies don't tell us much, but what it does tell us here was that most, the most frequent words were discussions and meetings. So that at least starts to hint towards what Twitter is actually used for, and it's just to promote or to, uh, yeah, to promote what the diplomatic branch is doing. We are not putting ideas right there. We are just putting who did we met and who did we discuss. They tend to be very vague messages. They tend to be messages always referring to somebody, but not much else. We are not making these policy statements. We are not making anything anything more broader, and as we're gonna see later. So then, then when I did my keyword analysis, I started to uh, to understand that there are different topics between each of the each of the prime ministers. The prime ministers speak distinctively different between each other. So Gakaria, for example, as we can see in the screen to the right, that's the keyword analysis. The more close we go to the right, the more representative our word is from Gakaria, and the more we go to the left, it's more representative of other members in the data set. So Gakaria 
had to speak about the pandemic, has to be, speak about politics, has to speak about cooperation with international partners because he had the COVID crisis on him. So it's certain, it's, it's only natural that there are different topics that they're going to be speaking of. When, whenever we see the Garibashvili one, <clears throat> Garibashvili is speaking much more about security, speaks about regional security, regional agreements, because there were wars going near him. And well, as we approach Ukraine, there's starting to be much more mentions about Ukraine. But as I said, most of the time we are speaking about discussions and meetings. It's not that we are speaking right now of like, oh, we are doing all of these efforts of the pandemic, but instead I met with von der Leyen to speak about the pandemic. That's how we are articulating most of the things we are utilizing. Um, then when it came to my uh, topic modeling, what I found is that effectively, eventually, uh, effectively they are at least for uh, for topics that we can find uh, quantitatively, not utilizing crowdsourcing. And these are uh, international economics, foreign policy and security, Western integration politics, and international sentiment. So international economics is basically whenever we are speaking about international developments in economics. We are not saying come here to Georgia to invest because we are good at this or that. Neither we are saying this is our monetary policy or this is our uh, uh, let's say a monetary policy strategy or anything like this we are not putting that forward we are just saying we met with imf they gave us a loan we met with the world bank they told us this so we are just saying how is it that we met with these different people relevant for economics when it comes to foreign policy and security here we are mostly speaking about the us and nato and it was quite interesting the fact that gary Bashvili was one of the main uh, persons inside this topic. And as I said before, it has to be the period where he had. There were a lot of meetings with NATO, a lot of meetings with the US, or a lot of reference toward this. Here's where we start seeing a lot of mentions as well to um, to the vice president, to the US president and vice presidents. So in foreign policy and security, that's what we're trying to capture. Then international sentimental statements is something that I think was the least um, interesting because here we're speaking about really broad things like, for example, my condolences with France because of a given attack or um, congratulations uh, over some cultural event, which happened a lot during Kirikashvili and Bakhtatse periods. In Kirikashvili, we see a lot of things which are relevant to culture and in Bakhtatse, we see a lot of more general tweets. When it comes to politics and Western integration, I want to make a very big parenthesis here and say, when we are saying that we are speaking about politics, what we are speaking about is actually developments. Whenever we met with somebody to discuss something and we discuss about elections or we discuss about political reform, that's what we are saying. It's not that we are saying developments that happened in Georgia because we are not communicating things that are actually happening in Georgia, but instead, who did we met and who did we spoke with? And when it came to Akaria, Akaria was the main person speaking about these topics. A lot had to do because of the meetings with, uh, with EU officials or discussion with EU officials and references to things that were changing during the pandemic. As again, it is very representative of the context that they were. It's important to say that all of these topics were in all of the prime ministers to some sort of to, to some to some degree. But there were some topics that were more characteristics of some prime ministers over other ones. When it comes to the network analysis, what you can see to the right is the actor network of Georgian prime ministers. It's this thing that I told you where you can see all the mentions, replies, calls, and retweets. I know that it looks very small, and that's because PowerPoint did not allow me to push the HTML, which I don't think I can change it right now, but that, it, it didn't allow me to put the HTML. But on the green, you can see Karikashvili's mentioned replies, calls, and retweets. On red, Bakhtatse, then uh, Gakaria here in, in orange, and in black, Karikashvili. So the first thing that I can say about the network analysis, and this part of the things that I'm still doing right now, is that the EU is the most interactive international partner. Commissioners and institutional accounts have the biggest metrics of centrality across all of the categories. and. I'm not saying the EU here as the EU as one, because I'm speaking about the EU as each separate account. It's much more than what we see with the US. And that's already told us who is that we try to interact the most, and that's the EU. And it's something that it may sound obvious because of things that are happening right now, but it's not necessarily that obvious when we're speaking about how is the EU and how is the US uh, prioritized when it comes to the foreign policy. This is something that it would be good to analyze further later on. So I'm moving to my general findings to, to finish because time is running out, is that what I found in general is that Twitter is an unexplored tool and that we only utilize it as a promotion arm for diplomatic activities. In Georgia, we don't follow this idea that we are just sharing news about us or that we are trying to actually communicate any policy like we do see in other uh, regional partners. In our case, we just promote the things that our diplomatic branch is doing. The use of Twitter is only reserved for economic, security, and foreign policy. And here there is a very big thing missing, which was one of the main reasons why I started doing this research, is there is no politics. 
So we know that the domestic discourse are starting to go down spiraling, but in Twitter that doesn't exist. There is a very big gap between what happens in domestic discourse and Twitter discourse. That may be influenced by who is the audience that they're trying to do, and also by the language that they're doing. I think that this leads me to my future research recommendation. I just want to make one last point, which is on the use of discourse on Facebook. So as I just said, there is a very big gap between domestic and discourse and Twitter discourse. All of these conflicting statements that we have heard before towards the EU or towards the US do not appear in Twitter whatsoever. Not even a mention or things that happen. Like we have this thing in Twitter where we are not reacting to things. When the whole discussions about candidacy is starting appearing, we don't react. We do put we do put forward that oh we submit our questionnaire, but nothing about the discussions whatsoever. Even when Georgia was hinted that he was not going to get the candidate status, and we only got one reaction yesterday, the first time over a very long period of time when we had no reactions. Ukraine happened, no reaction either. So there is this big gap between the domestic discourse and the Twitter discourse, and I would recommend future researchers that are able to process Facebook data quantitatively, um, comp computationally, which is something very hard because of Jordan language, that they may be able to quantify this and may be able to explore this gap between the domestic discourse and the Twitter discourse. Because as I said, it is very, it's, it's very big and it would allow us to see more of, if the domestic discourse does not really permeate the Twitter discourse, then is it really an ideological reason why the domestic discourse started going down spiral, or is it more of an electoral reason? So, that I think would be it, and I'm happy to answer questions later on. Sorry for going over time. Lucas, thanks a lot. Now we have about 15 minutes for question and answer session. And uh, uh, if you have a question, please either raise your hand uh, and speak it out, or uh, just you know type it here, and I will read it out. So far. I don't see a hand, I, I think. Kova, can I, can I ask a question? Of course. <laughs> I wanted to ask Dato. Um, well, I know that, I, that we spoke a little bit about how, in, how to work with Georgian language computationally. So I want to ask you, like, how do you do, if you did translations automatically and if you were able to analyze uh, media, so video, images, and et cetera. Uh, Lucas, yeah, thank you so much. So for this project, what we did is that we didn't go, I mean, as we had to analyze like three languages, like quantitatively. Uh, so as you, as you saw, we did some topic modeling, but that topic modeling, well, unfortunately, it's based on the machine translation of the, of the, of the post text. But uh, so it was a big surprise for me to see that actually did it pretty well. So if you look at the keywords and the, the results of topic modeling after you like to clean up all the kind of the data, it's actually, uh, I mean, all the kind of the themes that were identified uh, uh, were um, kind of made, all made sense, let's say so. So that's why I thought that perhaps it's uh, one of the ways to go further with um, with the, with the, with the tech short data and so-called like um, uh, uh, like less uh, uh, with languages that has have less resources and unfortunately neither of the three languages have uh, have like the, uh, are kind of well supplied with um, kind of uh, uh, text analysis tools but uh, I mean eventually uh, but eventually I hope that we can develop a tool that can be used for tokenizing properly the Georgian language. I know that there are some ways of doing it in Armenian. Azerbaijan is a little bit tricky because the ones that exist are based on Turkish, which uh, in many cases makes sense, but in some cases it doesn't make sense, doesn't take into consideration the specificities of, uh, uh, um, of, of the language structure of Azerbaijan language. Um, but as for the yeah, uh, but as for the audio and the kind of the, the video materials or visual materials, uh, we didn't do it in this case. Case, but we still try to document like, things that were uh, interesting for us. But I mean, I'm not sure we can do the kind of automated analysis at this stage. That would be yeah. lovely, of course. Okay, here are some questions uh, from our. Colleague from Yerevan, Hegine Manasian. Greetings, Hegine Jan. Uh, question to Lucas. Uh, 
Thank you for sharing the results of your exciting study. And there are two questions. Do you have any idea regarding who prepares the posts, the prime ministers or their assistants or press officers? This may differ by PM's um, impact on the number of tweets. The second question, you did mention Moldova as a comparison. What about the Western leaders? Yeah, so thank you for the question. Uh, it allows me to speak a little bit more about things that I had to leave, leave out. So in terms of who prepares the tweets, so that's something that we cannot know unless we actually interview these people, something that I did, I couldn't have access to. But what I can say from the data is that it's very clear that it doesn't really matter that much. And the reason why it doesn't really matter that much is because this is for me one of the most surprising things that I found across the data set is that it seems to be a constant on the amount of times that we tweet and for what do we tweet. So it's, Perhaps it may have been prepared by one of the assistants, or it may have been prepared by the prime minister itself. But for me, what it speaks more is that there is at least a coordinated way in which we are utilizing Twitter. They are not utilizing it like Donald Trump, for instance, to speak their mind on what something that is happening, but they are speaking instead about something that they know that they are going to be using Twitter for this or for that, which in this case is to promote visits. If they look if you, you look at the tweets and you then look how they speak in English, they, it, it kind of makes sense that most probably they are not the same people. Um, but as, as I said, like what we, what we can see is that it does seem to be constant. Perhaps it's the same press officer across all of these prime ministers. I wouldn't know that, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's, that's not the case and instead we are seeing a more coordinated use. When it comes to the Moldova as a comparison, thank you for that because I was actually trying to prepare something about what happened during the whole can candidacy period. And I did look at Moldova, I looked at Serbia, I looked at Albania, I, tried, I also looked at some of the commission leaders. And this is, a, this is what... The, this is the huge difference. So when it comes to Moldova, for instance, in the case of Moldova, the account of the prime minister of Moldova has only around, if I, perhaps, perhaps I'm getting it wrong, so I can tell you exactly how was it, but it doesn't have much, much more followers, than the, it doesn't have more followers than Garibashvili has, but it has more impact. And the reason why they have more impact is because they tweet more often. And who do they tweet more often? They tweet more often at the EU. And during the whole this candidacy period, I could also see that Moldova was tweeting much, much more when it came about EU issues. You could see that they did this the whole tour around EU, EU capitals because the president of Moldova, in this case, not the, not the prime minister, tweeted all about it. It's like you could see a live tweeting about everything that was happening and who they were meeting and why did they record, why should they have been given the um, candidacy because a lot of times they were speaking of they did much more self promotion over Ukraine something that we did not do we barely spoke about Ukraine whereas Moldova was always emphasizing their role as refugee uh, providing help for refugees and, pro um, and like how important it was for them because the war was going on next door so there was much more mention about these topics and when it comes to other EU leaders and this is I think it's the main difference is that the EU leaders, EU politicians, not even EU leaders, are all EU politicians, they do differ on what do they say. They share news about themselves, they do, they share visits that they have, they also do, but they share also topics. They engage into actual conversation of a topic. If you would go, for example, today to on the lines web page, a Twitter page, you are going to see a whole essay on the, on, the, on the candidates. If you would have gone before into the strategic compass, they, will, they had like these long essays on why comp the strategic compass matter. And whenever we are going into more, not the, let's say, not that, not that big, like to say, for example, ministers of parliament, they engage with the audience that they have as well. They were, there are a couple of parliamentarians which have spoken about Georgian and they don't speak out. I have a visit with a given politician and this is what we spoke. No, they spoke directly on what is it that they, what they wanted. Um, so, so I think that that's different. Ho hopefully I answer your question. Thank you. Thanks, Lucas. A, a question from uh, Hans Goodbrot to Mariam. Um, where do these young Azerbaijanis see their future? Um, at least in um, in case of my interviews, I can say that it's um, Georgia and it has many reasons uh, to uh, emphasize also the, the Insawe's language role is that these people put 
and a lot of effort to learn Georgian language. The quality of the education uh, in the Georgian ed language education is really low. So it's not uh, easy. Most of them acquire fluency in Georgian during the, their bachelor studies. Um, and they are doing it uh, to create their future in Georgia. And, and it's not uh, very easy to give up uh, also so, so much effort, even if you feel sometimes frustrated or alienated. But what is very interesting and important uh, is also that lately, uh, Georgia and Azerbaijan is started uh, going back with historical um, narratives. And that's what I was talking about, this kind of uh, ethnic revivalism. When they are talking uh, a lot about uh, Azerbaijani ethnic culture, but this is something different. This is for them virtually ethnic culture, which uh, is seen and framed uh, in the Georgian, as a part of Georgian uh, political space. And I just um, didn't have time for everything, but it's also very interesting the identity issues, because if, they, if you ask Georgian Azerbaijans how they would describe themselves, what they would call themselves, it's not even like that, not everyone tells me, Azerbaijani, for example, very often this was, for example, preferred virtually, virtually Turk or Georgian Turk or Georgian Azerbaijani because Azerbaijani, um, some of them told me that the uh, term Azerbaijani is related very much with uh, location. Uh, when they have this narrative uh, that Georgian Azerbaijan is never lived on the uh, modern Azerbaijani territory, but we're living um, in the territory of historical uh, Georgia and their grandparents or great grandparents had in the passports written Turk or virtually Turk and not um, Azerbaijani. So these kind of narratives um, have also their influence and language role is also that the young people who learned Georgian, who came in uh, Tbilisi, who involved in the uh, non-government organization activities, so on, they found each other. <laughs> and uh, we, we are seeing very interesting movements and very interesting framing of this bottom-up civic or multicultural um, nationalism. Thank you. Here's another question for you, Mariam. Uh, uh, the, uh, the person uh, uh, yes, yes, is asking whether your, your, your research is published or to, to yeah, cited uh, somewhere. It's so, only yeah, few right. uh, online databases. I, I really want to publish working uh, working on it, but it will not be a problem. I'll, I'll send um, my work anyone interested to just just write to me, it's, it's, it's no problem at all. So yeah, then there's yeah. another another person. Yeah, that was the say, yeah. same, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm often and even happy to send you my work, discuss these issues with you, just get in touch with me. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Let me see if I see hands. I don't see uh, messages. Uh, okay, I, one, one question to uh, Dato and Lucas. It's more kind of hypothetical question, uh, not directly related to your uh, current presentations, but probably um, about future research. Uh, as Lucas mentioned, uh, Twitter, it's, it's, it's totally directed to um, foreign communications and specifically in English. Uh, I, don't, it's a, I don't know, have you ever seen if our president also communicates in English and not in French because she is partly French? That's kind of a fun question, but more, more importantly, if you replicate, you know, partly what Dato did and partly what um, Lucas did on Facebook. Uh, in, in terms of what people call polarization, but 
I don't like the term and Hans wrote great piece uh, arguing that this is not right term for our political um, conditions right now. But whatever there is, there is there, there are there disagreements or um, when, when you looked that at uh, lack of hate speech in a very tense, about a very tense and very hostile event. Now you should see if on uh, Georgian, you know, peaceful politics, how many hate speeches can you see there? Uh, so it would be fascinating on the one hand to analyze that, but on the other hand, I don't expect a very good picture there. But uh, my question is that my question is about feasibility given Facebook restrictions and um, uh, uh, access to personal data, how, how feasible is to do something like that on Facebook, not to overkill, you know, 20 people by collecting things by hand and then analyzing that later. So machine learning or something else. So on, okay, on one of the reasons why I wanted to do how, what I did and I did how I did it on taking this very, very quantitative approach and data science approach was because I was, aiming for creating a scalable solution to doing this thing. So if you would go and try to replicate my thing into Twitter, again, something that I would need to do with, for example, opposition members, you can just add them to my code and they're gonna be there and you're gonna have it there easily replicable. When it came to Facebook, the, orig the project originally started as me wanting to compare Facebook and Twitter. And we went with that to try to understand most of these things to process the data in Facebook. But the data in Facebook, faces two issues. The first issue is Georgian. So tokenizing, thematizing Georgian words, it's already quite complicated. It's not necessarily a killing obstacle because you could make the caveat to say, we did not thematize this. But then when I tried to do that, what we did find is that there's a lot of duplicated results because there are a lot of Georgian words which mean the same thing, but they're written differently. And the computer, cannot capture the fact that they are the same words. So you have, that's problem number one. And problem number, number two is what I asked that about media and videos. So originally, and in the CrowdTangle account that we have in CRC, I prepared this massive list of political communications here. But we have a, but I had a very big problem, especially when it came to Gariashvili, and I actually think it was pretty smart. He does not write, write. he, Puts, puts his videos, his images, which we cannot capture. Like right now, we know that there are some tools that are being developed as we speak on try to capture video and trans put it into a transcript. And if that would be the case, then we can try to process it. But until that is again, we cannot do anything about that. So on the one side, you have that. And then to try to capture this polarization still, I still think that you have ways to go. Because one of the things that I did not finish doing is adding here opposition and adding here um, the media, for example, in the Twitter side. I do expect them to be strikingly different because also it's who interacts with them. So if we start seeing that there is much, much more difference on how do these other members of the political realm communicate, then you can already start seeing some of the differences. The other problem, the, 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 the one positive thing that perhaps somebody else much more smarter and much more programmatically adept than me can do is actually go over the embassies as well, because the embassies do post in English and they post, but they post it in this very convoluted way, which I cannot understand why would they do it like that, but they say that they do the same post in Georgian and in English packed together. So my problem is has always been depacking them and try to get the English part, but that because of how Facebook decides to put their data, it's not that easy. But you could do it, it requires a lot of work. But I, but, and this is the last thing I wanna say, what Dato did and what I did combined together, that's the best approach whenever we are doing this type of work. We always, like my my work was supposed to be the starting, but we, we start with what I did of doing this unsupervised topic modeling, network analysis and all of these things we start doing. And then we identify right now with me, you know that there are four topics in Twitter. So the next more logical thing would be getting somebody to crowdsource a big bunch of tweets, following to see if my topics were correct. I tried to do that, but I had a problem. I have a big problem in terms of um, intercoded reliability when I wanted to do my topic classification. But if I would have a bigger set, a bigger set with a much better coding schemes, probably you could do this. 
it takes a little bit more time. You still require to burden 10 like people to read like 10 to 20,000 tweets that or tweets or Facebook posts that you, you cannot escape that. But that's the approach that you want. You would like to combine our two things. I don't know that way, usually. Uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with Lucas that the combined uh, approach actually gives uh, gives the gives the best uh, uh, gives the best uh, result in this case. Uh, of course, first of, first and foremost, this is the nature of like, the Georgian language that basically, uh, first of all, of course, it's like really hard to tokenize or like divide into stems, and secondly it's very important like the word combinations right the co-occurrence of combination of words or like basically the context let's say so and i think the potential way of uh, uh, as they call like bigrams which is the combination of like two words or like trigrams or three words uh, so, I mean, if something has to be done programmatically, I guess the best uh, way is to do like through these combining two or three words. And, uh, and of course, secondly, uh, the adding to this, the quantitative labeling or at the work of uh, human uh, monitors, at least on the partial data set, and then train the major data sets using this uh, kind of already kind of labeled data. We, we have used that in other contexts. Um, that also might be the way to go. And uh, finally, uh, yeah, I think that's um, uh, kind of the two major caveats that we are having here. And uh, Lucas mentioned that, uh, and the rightfully said that if something, if a post is kind of uh, uh, aimed at a foreign audience or non-Georgian audience, even on Facebook, they usually would post it in two languages and say that, okay, for English, scroll down, or for Georgian, scroll down. So, but yeah, this is definitely something that uh, could be done. I mean, uh, could we, uh, but uh, as in order to use the crowd tangle tool, we need to have a, uh, the Facebook pages, not the like the individual Facebook accounts, and uh, usually many politicians use individual Facebook accounts rather than official pages to communicate with the public. So that's also a bit of a challenge, and I don't know how Facebook will deal with that in the future. Actually, if if I may jump in there, so actually, the, as that to say, our biggest problem when we work with Facebook is what can we see? We can see pages, and we can see groups that are public. So if the group is public, I can see what it is. The problem is that, and we saw this, especially when it comes to, to this information research, a politicized group is not public almost every time. But what we can do, though, is there are certain experiments that are being put forward on seeing where is it that you see the news and how is it that you react when you see that news. The problem of doing this is that you can do this in Europe, you can do this in the US, because they do have a much more, um, they like, they, they, they do expect people to be a little bit more um, willing to how to download a software, how to like, like how to set it up in your computer and then me being able to do a whole experiment on social media with that. The problem is that perhaps in, in Georgia, I don't know if that would be that much possible, but you could try to do with this type of experiments, create a fake web page, try to recreate the amount of reach they have and see what can you see and what can, what happens in your own web page you know, in your own page because you can see what you what you do so there are some alternatives to making experiments on it but me trying to see what is it that happens on the random post of one person that is in the bazaar posts a picture and there is a whole discussion going on in twitter in facebook i cannot see that one but there are workarounds like if Mark Zuckerberg is listening to us, please open Facebook API, but that most <laughs> probably won't happen. So, yeah. It used to opposite. open. I, I, I saw at the early Facebook uh, times, people would do their own network analysis uh, and post, here is my personal network. And now you can do, or you could do it for someone else, but now not anymore. Anything else? Um, any other questions? Oh, let's see. Uh, there is a question. Oh, actually, there is no question. It's a big thanks to you all from Hegine. And I fully agree and join Hegine with thanking you guys with excellent presentations. 
and excellent discussion after that. So thank you. We are also doing great with timing exactly uh, 1.30 and now we break for half an hour and come back with uh, session five at two. Thank you and see you soon. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Dato, are you there? Any chance you left already? I guess he left. Lucas, anything you want me to tell Dato or anything? No, I was just going to ask him a question. Okay. I'm just going to do it for Twitter, I guess. Okay, so, okay. Um, welcome back, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, chair another exciting panel uh, at our conference. Um, this panel <coughs> is titled as Discourses and the Patterns of Migration in Georgia. And as you might have guessed from the name, uh, it is uh, uh, about various dimensions of uh, the migration process in our country. Uh, so, and uh, we'll have three participants uh, 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 in, 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 in this panel. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm going to introduce each of them uh, prior to their presentations. Uh, and uh, yeah, just a quick uh, housekeeping, so to say, uh, we'll have 15 minutes for presentation. I'll remind you about, uh, uh, about uh, uh, I will remind you about uh, the passing of 13 minutes. Uh, so please, uh, let's try to keep uh, track of time. And we'll have 15 more minutes at the end of our presentations for Q&A session. So uh, I'm looking, and I think everyone is looking forward for the great conversation. Uh, so please uh, welcome our first presenter, um, Tina Tsoumaya from Georgian Institute of Public Affairs, GIPA. Uh, and, uh, uh, her presentation uh, is titled Migration Coverage by the Georgian Media in 2019 and 2021. Uh, Tiko, uh, the uh, floor is yours. Feel free Thank to share your screen and uh, present your paper. Thank you so much. Uh, I mean, I'm ex extremely happy and excited to be part of this uh, wonderful conference. And, um, uh, you know, it's my privilege to actually present my paper to you at the presentation. Um, let me just quickly arrange the technical things here. Uh, okay, I think I'm done. Yeah. Oh, uh, today I will be talking about uh, how uh, migration is covered by Georgian media, but we have looked into the uh, period of 2019-2021 years. So, I mean, since then, many things have been changed. And as you know, Ukrainian crisis, Ukraine, war in Ukraine has changed a lot um, in relation to migration. Therefore, I mean, this topic, unfortunately, I think uh, will remain. And because of the many other global issues, will, uh, migration will remain the most important topic uh, for uh, research and for poli policy makers and mo most importantly for um, ordinary people, right? Those who actually are affected uh, by um, um, by different different things that uh, actually causes the migration. But now we will be uh, concentrating we will come back to you know year of 2019-2021 and so the purpose of this uh, uh, quantitative content analysis was to analyze what were the migration related frames in the Georgian media and for this uh, content analysis uh, we uh, actually uh, selected number of uh, a television, online media, and newspaper uh, across the two-year period. So here you see the list of the uh, media outlets uh, that I have been uh, actually 
monitoring. We were, we have been monitoring. So let me just quickly mention my colleagues, uh, Nino Tsapsianidze and Nino Machvilaze, both uh, are uh, GPA affiliated professors. You know, uh, you know, we uh, three of us uh, together actually uh, um, uh, made this monitoring and also put the analysis together. And now we are, uh, I'm happy to present these results to you. So as you know, uh, actually, uh, so um, migration is a very, very important topic. And actually, uh, you know, when when I was when we were doing this monitoring uh, project, uh, so we had two things in mind, because you know, we were look, looking in Georgian context, right? And, you know, one was Medea, uh, the Medea story, as you know, uh, Medea is a, a very uh, how to say archetype <laughs> of uh, Georgian uh, woman, uh, but not only Georgian. Uh, for I mean, she's not known only uh, as a Georgian woman, but now uh, with the face of uh, face, in the face of Medea, we are actually seeing. Uh, uh, the migrant women, uh, vulnerabilities of migrant women, uh, actually, um, uh, that we kind of all have heard through different uh, uh, mediums or uh, the different uh, channels, right? So one is media, so, so we were interested uh, about immigrants, okay, men and women, of course, I mean, both of them, but uh, also, you know, uh, gender issues were part of our uh, research design and then we also had in mind you know story of abo let's let's put it like that someone who has migrated <laughs> to georgia right um so uh, this uh, so these two uh, uh, things uh, we, we wanted to study these two things uh, in our research uh, but but oh, of course i mean as you know uh, georgia uh, because of the armed conflict Georgia experienced in 90s and in 2008, uh, we have uh, a, a huge number of displaced people, also migrants, escapees from their own land. But, you know, this was not, uh, you know, uh, in our monitoring, so we were not actually concentrating on IDPs, but, I mean, these were people, uh, uh, you know, who actually... Uh, immigrants and emigrants who were crossing the country, okay, either from Georgia or uh, to Georgia. Uh, well, so uh, so um, uh, overall, uh, I will I will quickly tell you about the you know basic results, and then probably if there is time time left, I will be able to answer the questions. Overall, media coverage of migration was pretty relatively balanced let's let's put it like that okay so some basics were there uh, but reporting on migration was dominated by emigration issues in other words it was more more ab about media uh, you know stories so those people who actually emigrated uh, from Georgia. As for the immigration uh, it was larger largely absent so this was the very important uh, uh, actually, uh, result. So, uh, as you see, emigration ninety three percent versus immigration six percent. So, uh, yeah, uh, and this is kind of this is true with uh, the whole um, uh, uh, the whole spectrum that I have uh, uh, we have monitored. But as you see, there are certain uh, media outlets here, something like uh, I. Sakartvelo Damsoplio, Asaval Dasavali, okay, uh, that actually also touched the immigration uh, problem, right? And as you see, these are, you know, Sakartvelo Damsoplio is mostly, it's a very conservative and very kind of nationalistic um, audience oriented media outlet. So th that means, and, and also, you know, the coverage was not very uh, sensitive and uh, uh, neutral and balanced in this uh, media. In other words, so immigration related uh, stories were either absent or it was just very, uh, you know, uh, insensitive, insensitive reporting. Okay. 
uh, uh, well, let's see uh, what else do we have. So, of course, I mean, we use the um, uh, theory of uh, framing. Uh, and uh, so we tried to understand what frames media was uh, actually covering uh, um, and using while reporting on migration. And uh, based on the um, uh, code book, so we had our uh, we prepared our code book, and uh, so we had certain, uh, based on the recent uh, uh, publications, we had uh, uh, these uh, frames, uh, uh, you know, in mind. So, uh, and actually, uh, what we what we have seen here, you see that the moral frame uh, was uh, a most uh, uh, most popular frame, frequently used frame was moral, then was coming human interest, then responsibility, then threat and uh, further economic threat. There were other frames as well, but you know, these were five dominant uh, frames. And as you see, these are very kind of, uh, that's why I, I, I told you that media coverage was pretty more relatively balanced because you know these are very nice fra frames right that means that you know uh, the, the, based on these frames media was uh, talking about migration as something that is morally important to actually you know support uh, um, uh, em migrants migrants uh, okay but as you know emigrant emigration was the um, em em um, mo most frequently um, uh, covered topic, right? And then human interest stories as well, right? So there were also some human interest that we, uh, media was paying attention to human interest stories as well. Otherwise, you know, we heard of people when, uh, you know, we were talking, uh, when media was talking about immigration. So actually, uh, as you see here, um uh, you know um uh, this uh, social uh, uh, this network analysis uh, actually gives you again the idea right so you see repeating basically myself because you know moral human interest responsibility economic um conflict frame and security so these were the major uh, frames uh, that were used by Georgian media okay so um, uh, it's also interesting um, who were the actors right I mean we also looked at which actors were most frequently uh, represented in Georgian media and as you see so uh, migrant is you know uh, but mostly these were emigrants but then you know uh, these um, other actors that were present so these were uh you know uh, state actors for example public servant local government uh, government official or state leader or men member of par parliament. So these were all state actors. And besides, a migrant was represented most frequently. Still, when you calculate all other actors and when you see who are they, you see that all state actors still prevail uh, um, migrants here in, in our media coverage. Okay, so governmental actors versus migrant, it, it's still so you see that media gives a, a voice most frequently not to migrants, but you know, state officials, right, which is interesting to notice. Okay, so um, uh, then um, uh, this is uh, actually the uh, also the image that um, repeats my previous statements right here you you see all the actors who are active and also you see which actor is uh, you know uh, spreading which frame and as you know the moral a moral and responsibility frames were and human interest as well but 
as you see, more is more uh, popular frame that was used by these actors. That means that you know that these people, the government officials or state people, you know, they were saying that it's important to help. It's important to see. So we are doing a lot. We are helping. We are supporting. So it's important to support, and we are supporting. It was kind of self-representation of you know uh, the, the the things that uh, you know these people were doing, right? So when we looked into the migrant quotes, right, it was like uh, uh, migrants versus non-migrants. So, so you see that migrants are underrepresented here as well, right? So uh, it's more non-migrant people are talking and speaking about migrants, right? So this is uh, unfortunately what was happened. Of course, I mean, we it's better that you know the, the coverage is more oriented to the uh, to migrants, but. That's what we have. Uh, we also looked uh, in the, into the women uh, actors versus uh, men actors, and I mean, it, it's not, it won't be a surprise for you. Okay, thank you. It won't be a surprise for you that so uh, female sources were in minority, right? I mean, all these state officials or, you know, state representatives or, you know, influential people, they were men, right? So and th they were talking about how important it is to help and support um, migrants, mostly emigrants, right? Uh, yeah, so uh, actually, uh, um, uh, Yes, actually, I've already talked about these issues, but I will just maybe uh, emphasize more that, you know, this uh, third type of case uh, of, you know, this very um, tiny uh, part of this uh, coverage that was connected to immigrants. This was uh, mainly represented uh, mostly by the threat and conflict frames, and it was portraying immigrants as a threat to Georgian culture, giving rise to prejudiced attitudes towards immigrants, uh, which is, uh, you know, it, it's just intolerant and uh, not sensitive uh, coverage, right? Uh, but uh, uh, the, the rest of the media, so this uh, like very, um, uh, uh, this type of media, which was concentrated on immigration, is uh, very conservative. But you know, the rest, more liberal or more, more centrist liberal, uh, more centrist media was silent. Okay, about the immigrant issue, which is also needs to be acknowledged a little bit, right? I mean, because you know, more coverage is needed, and uh, you know that's important. And finally, uh, you know, I will just uh, mention here that. Uh, again, this coverage that we have looked, it was like 2019, 21 years. And since then many uh, things have changed. And these are the beautiful, uh, you know, uh, postcards that uh, we are sent to Cosmos <laughs> by, uh, you know, uh, Facebook users, uh, Georgian Facebook users uh, to Ukrainian people, because, you know, uh, we see that, um, situation has changed towards immigrants, okay, uh, with Ukrainians, we became more tolerant, even if you talk to uh, um, uh, internally displaced people, they are surprised because, you know, they felt totally different thing when they experienced being, uh, you know, escapees uh, and uh, uh, migrants in, in their own land, right? I mean, the Georgian society was not that tolerant, but now, uh, I mean, we, we see the different dynamics and of course it would be very interesting to see uh, and look at what is happening now okay how media is reflecting on this reality but unfortunately i did not study it but you know hopefully i will study it thank you so much for your attention uh, professor tomaria thank you so much uh, and uh, let me welcome our next presenter uh professor ekaterina pritzhala of tbilisi state university and uh, Professor Pritzhala will, will deliver a presentation titled Georgian Migrants in Germany. The uh, floor is yours. It's muted. Thank you very much. <laughs> 
Uh, it is very honor for me to be participant uh, this conference. Uh, 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 in this year, I did it uh, good because uh, I remember about that line and finally I'm here. <laughs> Thank you very much. About uh, um, Shortly about my research, this is continue my work about Georgian migrants who are living in European Union countries. I started it uh, in 2015 from Portugal after was France and now this is about uh, Georgian migrants in Germany. I know the mm, uh, title is very wide, but I uh, I will specify uh, uh, the topic of what uh, I will present today. You know, Ger uh, Germany is very far away from uh, Georgia, and this is uh, what I wanted to show. What was many purpose? Sorry, what uh, many purpose? Uh, my uh, work was to study dynamic of the adaptation process of Georgian migrants uh, in new social, social cultural space, uh, intra-group, intergroup relations uh, according to acculturation and preserving their identity, what they have, uh, what is changing when they are moving in other country. Uh, uh, we have a lot of work about this and what happens when Georgian are living abroad. Uh, the, and um, the possibility I had uh, according to Dia Den Rustaveli Foundation postdoc fellowship program, and I spent some time in Germany. Research question was a lot, but I uh, try to introduce um, uh, some of them. What was the reason of migration and especially to Germany, why they choose this country? How the process adaptation is going uh, in this country? What kind of uh, they have perception uh, towards to host society and to they are um, another uh, member of their uh, culture. I mean, Georgians who are living in Germany, uh, typical variation of cultural identity uh, and uh, what kind of attitude they have toward the Georgia. Um, and what they are thinking about the future, they are living uh, abroad or they are uh, planning to come back. Theoretical framework, I uh, use different uh, framework, but uh, mainly it was very uh, about migration, immigration, acculturation and adaptation. About uh, uh, identity strategies, I used the Kamila Malevska prayers, a strategy of identity and uh, different uh, um, scholars. Um, you know better, I think, migration uh, background of Jew from uh, for Georgians, uh, it started after the collapse Soviet Union. Uh, first, it was the post-Soviet Republic, and uh, um, later started European Union and uh, United States of America. According to experts, migration from Georgia is divided in three periods. It is between 19 and 95, previous century. Um, uh, the second was in 95, 2005, and uh, the last version according to the experts is after the rose revolution um, and uh, as I mentioned before, it was especially first uh, post-Soviet Republic, Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. And as scholars uh, are arguing, this is because of uh, this uh, same language, because the language is very important for communication and uh, um, uh, the same uh, cultural uh, background what we had from Soviet um, past. But after, you know, what happened in Georgia, after the uh, war with uh, Russia, it uh, changed a little bit. And uh, uh, now there is uh, more specify uh, to European Union. And according to the um, International Center of Migration, you know, the Greece, Cyprus, USA, Germany, Spain, and Italy is most popular destination for Georgian peoples. Um, now, what is about uh, Georgian migrants in Germany? Statistical data, what I uh, had found, um, um, uh, 2,730 Georgians are living in Germany. Most of uh, uh, 
most are women uh, and ages between uh, this is more young generation i mean uh, from uh, uh, 25 to 45 but uh, for my um, um, my research i uh, prefer to interview my my research is qualitative uh, interview i took uh, 30 qualitative in-depth interview with georgians who are living there more than uh, 10 years. Uh, uh, and because of this period was uh, COVID regulation period, um, most part of my interview was uh, um, conducted by um, uh, Zoom. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, participant was eight men and 22 women. Unfortunately, it was noble sampling and uh, I uh, uh, tried everything to do my best, but uh, this is what I have at this moment. Uh, continue uh, about my research. Uh, as I told, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, it was a um, uh, different part, uh, um, uh, question about their living condition, uh, why they are choosing a German, uh, how they are in integrated in this uh, society, uh, which is very um, different uh, from our culture, uh, and uh, what kind of conflict they have intra uh, and intergroup relations. Uh, major terms and subterms, what I divided um, uh, to, uh, to uh, thematic uh, uh, content analysis, it was uh, past, present, and future. And a uh, uh, very important part of this interview was their Georgianis. Uh, and I'm still thinking about this, how analyzed what I get from this interview. Um, what was the reason why they choose uh, Germany? Uh, this was extreme situation, uh, what was uh, in Georgia, the civil war, war with the, um, uh, war in Abkhazia, critical situation, secondary. Uh, this is first uh, reason uh, they are arriving on this destination. Uh, the second part was uh, uh, who, who tried in from improving their life. They wanted to get um, better education uh, in Germany and uh, because they decided to, to immigrate to Germany. And uh, the academic exchange service offer, you know, about um, Opel Mädchen. We know uh, more about Mädchen, but it's uh, for um, uh, everyone and it is very helpful for Georgian to uh, go to German and continue their life. Uh, I tried uh, to identify what kind of they have collective identity according to Kamila Malevska prayer identity strategies and individual strategies. Collective strategies um, uh, uh, underlined as uh, the scholars underlined uh, most uh, um, people um, uh, often uh, people are underlined their privilege their uh, power to another uh, host society uh, where they, they are living an individual strategy in stigmatized um, in process of uh, um, living uh, they uh, always underline their uh, private and individual strategy uh, what is collective identity strategy? This is when cultural idealization, for example, uh, in my previous uh, um, uh, studies, uh, when they are underlined Georgian as, as collective identity, they are underlined uh, we, uh, because of Portugal are not high educated as we are. This is a quote from my um, participant uh, interview. Um, we um, uh, we don't believe the Portuguese uh, discovered uh, America. And in this uh, uh, case, uh, I could not get uh, uh, kind of this uh, idealization. They are cultural. Uh, the second, uh, when uh, first is when we are differentiate our culture and host culture. And second, when, when we underlined what is similar between our culture. Uh, and uh, what 
it was similar. It was uh, this uh, uh, Georgian, my participant, uh, discovered uh, public opinion is important in German as well as Georgian, because uh, sometimes people, when you don't know him, uh, they are only your neighbor they know about you everything and it was very unexpected um, for for georgians uh, about individual identity strategies uh, according to malevska um, uh, camilleri and malevska prayer the, they have ontological identity what divided pragmatic identity chameleon identity unnoticed identity differentiated identity what is between group and sometimes it is transferred negative identity when you are dividing uh, in your uh, culture uh, who are living abroad uh, differentiated uh, uh, things uh, and the most of Georgians uh, in Germany are using chameleon identity maybe it will we will call it as uh, pragmatic identity uh, they are changing their situation uh, um, according to the uh, area when they are because of uh, German uh, policy uh, um, uh, to uh, migrant people is uh, very interesting and very serious. Uh, they, I mean, Georgian, as well as uh, the other people who migrated to Germany, they have possibilities to get education and then get uh, work. Uh, in this case, uh, Georgian did not have unnoticed identity. When uh, you are quiet uh, and uh, uh, you are tried to uh, not to be mentioned uh, around uh, uh, your society. But when uh, I was talking with Georgian migrants who are living in Germany, they uh, are not in the case of uh, Georgians in Portugal. They underline this, uh, they don't feel stigmatized uh, their uh, uh, self, and uh, they, uh, they, uh, 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 they are feeling very comfortable in this uh, society. The second identity, what is uh, the similar all of Georgians Georgians, uh, according to my research in French, in uh, in France, in uh, Portugal, and in German, is a differentiated strategy. Strategy. Uh, what means? What was the different? And what is the different? Uh, difference uh, uh, differentiated is more uh, between us. Uh, then what is similar and uh, first it was a system of parenting uh, how different we are talking with our child uh, and uh, what what kind of difference is georgian mother and father uh, from uh, german value of relatives and family members uh, okay uh, and friendship this is very important what they underline and uh, about the the third identity strategies, this is the, um, transferred negative identities. When you are differentiated in uh, inside your culture, uh, they had uh, the uh, criminal uh, Georgian part of migrants is very shaming um, when they are talking about Georgian culture. They are always underlined and they they uh, called these people runner, more venali, like this, uh, uh, and uh, always uh, uh, are trying to cover this uh, because they had uh, um, a very bad situation or something like uh, this. Uh, and there is quote, I don't want to talk about the quote, about friendship, about parenting, but what is uh, uh, one minute about uh, homeland? What what is a uh, homeland at Georgianess for migrants who are living abroad? And I noticed uh, that when they are talking about Georgia, does not uh, um, um, uh, this uh, this is not. Uh, defending from uh, a period when they left Georgia, always they, they are talking about in Georgia life is very bad. Uh, um, uh, uh, they are uh, people from 19s and they are people from uh, go, um, who went uh, there after 2000. Uh, uh, 
uh, and I was thinking about steel, and I am thinking because of uh, uh, they are. I, this is my um, speculation because we are uh, um, we have the Chavchavadzes, Ilya Chavchavadzes uh, um, conceptualization. What is Georgia territory, language, and Christianis, uh, and uh, we have different kind of poems. What we are learn uh, learn uh, in our past, yeah. Okay, <laughs> they are feeling themselves as betrayed Georgia and because they have like this uh, attitudes to Georgia. Thank you very much. And I, I don't have time, <laughs> but uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Pilskhalava. We will have uh, the Q&A <clears throat> session. So I think we can expand on, on these topics and it's very, very important okay. topics uh, during the uh, Q&A session. So. Um, now let me introduce our uh, final presenter today, uh, Tatiana Sichnava. Um, uh, Tatiana, the floor is yours. Please uh, feel free to share your screen and uh, uh, continue with the presentation. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to greet all the participants of the conference, first of all. So I am a PhD student of Tbilisi State University, and today I'm going to present my research. It's my, it's a part of my um, PhD paper. So the title of the, uh, the title of the uh, report that I'm going to present today is the impact of COVID-19 and the consequent complicated policies on the labor migrants employed in Georgia. So first of all, uh, before we start with COVID-19 and the restrictions and its impact, uh, I want to shortly uh, once again revise Georgia's uh, immigration environment. So as you know, Georgia traditionally has been an uh, immigration country, but since 1990s, a large immigration flows has began. Nowadays, Georgia is still considered to be a migration country, but we can say that um, uh, immigration flows uh, are beginning uh, with the uh, developing of uh, the environment and first of all, uh, socioeconomic environment in the state. So uh, before the COVID-19 we had, you can see uh, here, um, an interesting uh, trends of immigration in recent years. So the number of immigrants has been increasing over the last decades uh, and it was upgoing. Uh, if, even we can mention that in 2020, uh, uh, the uh, migration balance was like uh, through the history independence, uh, through the history of independent Georgia, uh, it was, um, it was uh, um, uh, like immigrants uh, were uh, more than immigrants in this year. Of course, it has its own uh, reasons, uh, but uh, the thing is the important thing is that immigration is um, immigration is uh, enlarging in Georgia. And uh, of course, uh, it brings its own challenges to the state. The first, we can say that uh, the first main challenge is uh, legislation of the state, because first, uh, it has to deal not only with immigration and immigration issues, but also with newcomers that are coming to Georgia and it should provide some special needs to them, yeah? So COVID-19 pandemic has completely changed the lives of mankind, all people, and of course among them, the, one of the most vulnerable group of society, these were uh, migrants, of course, who were residing at that period in Georgia. Uh, let me show you the uh, number of systematic problems uh, that pandemic caused to foreigners that were coming in, that were working in Georgia, because my research was mostly based uh, on um, inter uh, in-depth interviews with labor migrants, like with labor migrant groups, because we know that uh, there are different groups of immigrants in Georgia. Many vulnerable groups um, uh, found themselves at a greater risk. So first of all, it was legal 
uh, status risk and because the state tightened its uh, immigration policy during the COVID-19. Also, they faced stigma and discrimination. They had linguistic and cultural barriers as they used to have before pandemic as well. And of course, worsening of economic and social situation in the state that had great impact also on immigrants. Uh, they were out of information and they didn't have access to public services. So I will, of course, speak about it in details. First of all, let me again uh, go into methods of my research. So first of all, um, I want to say that uh, research objects were labor migrants into cities of Georgia. It was Pilisian, but to me, because these are the largest city and the biggest cities uh, that um, attract economically, of course, first of all, um, uh, labor migrants. So most of them are residing in Tbilisi or in Batumi and they're working there. Uh, aim of the paper is uh, to assess the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on labor migrants in Georgia. And researchers' uh, question is how did the COVID-19 pandemic change the situation of labor migrants in Georgia? The main objectives of the research are to identify the challenges they have faced uh, during the last uh, one and one and a half years, analysis of the situation of persons with different legal status during COVID-19 and to study and compare the situation of migrants living in Tbilisi and Batumi during the pandemic. Uh, the report is based on the re, uh, the paper is based on the following methods of sociological research. I used in-depth interviews with labor migrants in both cities. Uh, I conducted expert interviews uh, and also document analysis in order to uh, research and in order to um, know more about the uh, changes in legislation and um in a legal uh, uh, environment so uh, let's start with in-depth interviews so research period was july november 2021 number of respondents 56 so 28 respondents were uh interviewed in tbilisi and 28 in batumi the study included migrants of or migrant workers of all types of income. So uh, it included uh, high uh, uh, skilled migrants as well as migrants with uh, lower skills. And also uh, the important thing is that we didn't focus on migrants from only one state. So we uh, decided to choose migrants from different countries. So here, different countries included developed countries, developed countries. Uh, I mean, mostly there were English speaking um, uh, foreigners, like people for uh, people whose uh, native language is English and also uh, immigrants from West Europe, Western Europe, post-Soviet countries. And the third group uh, included other countries, mostly from Asia and from Africa. So here in this table, you can see, I'm sorry, you can see uh, the detailed information about the features of the migrants. You see that uh, the number was equal in Tbilisi and Batumi. Uh, gender was almost equal, but in Batumi, you see that I have mostly male um, uh, respondents because you know that in Batumi, we have a uh, very intensive Turkish uh, immigration and mostly Turks are like male um, migrants yeah, who are coming to Batumi and mostly they are investing money in different um, economic fields. Marital status policy was more uh, interesting for single um, uh, immigrants while Batumi was attractive for immigrants with families and small kids. Um, also, uh, the research included um, immigrants of different legal status. So there were people who already had citizenship, people who had residence permit. You see there are working visa and visa-free regime because you know that Georgia has um, a special visa regime. This means that uh, immigrants from these countries doesn't 
uh, immigrants from these countries don't uh, need a visa to enter the country and they can stay here for one year. And um, this is approximately like immigrants from 90 different countries, yeah? And so it's uh, important to mention that in Batumi mostly, all immigrants uh, were without visa, without residence, without residence or without citizenship. So they were from visa-free regime countries and they mm, didn't have mm, any uh, documents um, that I have mentioned. So type of employers in Batumi, we also had um, Im important number of immigrants freelancers, so freelancers mostly choose Batumi for a living. And also you can see the different fields of work they choose to work in, in Georgia and of course positions. Now, uh, labor migrants were aged uh, from 20 to 71 and their average year was 27 for Tbilisi and 28 for Batumi. Uh, almost half of them were female labor migrants. I also conducted 13 in-depth interviews with experts in the field of migration, including scholars, uh, practitioners, public officials, and representatives of international organizations. So it should be mentioned that um, my paper is about labor migrants integration in Georgia. And so I also was very interested in the issue of their integration. So how did it change after the pandemic, after the COVID-19? Uh, what changes were there? So we have identified and comparatively analyzed the problems of socioeconomic and cultural life of labor migrants living in Pilisi Batumi, as well as integration into Georgian society. It should be mentioned that one, one interesting uh, problem that labor migrants had was, first of all, health issues problem. So it should be noted that uh, mostly respondents didn't have any um, health insurance during their stay. So uh, only those part of uh, working migrants had insurance whose company provided it. Other people didn't have any information about it. So during COVID, it was very difficult for them to get any health um, care um, services, yeah? Despite the fact that during the COVID-19, our state um, um, made it like free of charge if, if the even foreigner had COVID-19, um, uh, like first aid in this case was uh, absolutely free of charge for him. Uh, the procedure for paying the fine, you know that we had different fines for, for example, not wearing the mask or breaking the mask regime and so on. And these procedures was all, were also very uh, difficult and uh, very uh, time consuming for migrants. Uh, they didn't know how to manage it all, yeah? The state program of uh, our state also had, you know, financial assistance for the different groups. Uh, in order to sustain them after the COVID-19 and to help them. This program uh, included not only Georgian, um, Georgian uh, citizens, but also uh, some certain categories of migrants. Uh, especially it uh, included migrants who are under international protection, but it didn't apply to labor migrants uh, who didn't or to people who didn't have permanent or temporary residence permit. So uh, mostly uh, the respondents even didn't know anything about this program and its existence. Uh, during the pandemic, the access of public services to the on, uh, uh, so moved to online uh, sphere, online space. And uh, it was one more big problem for foreigners, first of all, because despite the fact that this website Stop COVID was functioning in six different languages, but frequently information was uploaded uh, a bit later or it was fragmented and governmental websites were functioning in Georgian, Russian, and English. And again, the basic information was published in Georgian language. So this was hard for them 
because mostly, you know, migrants in Georgia, they have language, serious language barrier, uh, because most of the migrants don't learn Georgian language or they don't know Georgian language. Uh, and because of this, uh, this problem is especially uh, concerning migrants from Asia, because mostly they speak only their native language, and it's hard for them to integrate because of language barriers. Government me measures taken during the second wave of COVID-19 post additional challenges to labor migrants. So first uh, measure, like uh, governmental measures taken during the uh, first COVID wave were uh, very successful, we know, and they were even um, um, they were even um, considered to be one of the best in the world. But in the second period, in the second wave of COVID-19, these restrictions uh, brought uh, double uh, challenges to labor migrants. And because, you know, mostly migrants uh, are um, employed in tourism and services related fields. And these are the sectors which had the greatest influence of COVID-19. And because of this, they were, we can say, uh, alliterated and, uh, co and uh, migrants were, stayed without, were staying without uh, income and without a uh, job. So now let's see the results. Uh, foreign citizens faced obstacles in terms of entering and leaving the territory of Georgia. So first of all, I, would, I should mention that during the closed borders, there were serious problems for even for the immigrants who had uh, residence permit. So they couldn't enter the country. And, uh, it is cons and some of the migrants considered it as um, a serious discrimination. Uh, uh, and so they couldn't enter the country. According to the regulations imposed during the COVID-19 year, entry restrictions were extended to foreigners with uh, Georgian residence permit. Uh, it should be noted that even European Union gave the right uh, to enter uh, its territory during closed borders to uh, residence permit holders, so non-EU uh, citizens. And in Georgia, this was restricted. Foreign nationals in Georgia note that xenophobic and racist and discriminatory attitudes have increased during the pandemic. This was especially towards um, uh, Far Eastern Asian countries, towards Chinese migrants, uh, and they have um, encountered this problem in both public and private spaces, also in social networks. Uh, the practice of unjustified refusal, refusal to issue a residence permit continues. You know that Georgia has a very liberal immigration politics, but we can say that this politics is a little bit uh, selective um, because it is uh, very, it is much more strict to some special migrant groups. In this case, we can speak about Asian and uh, African migrants because, first of all, they need to uh, they uh, re they are required to have visa in order to enter the country, and also it's very hard for them to uh, get residence permit, despite the fact that they um, buy real estate in Georgia. So they often buy real estate, but they after that after like one or two years, it's very hard for them to um, continue their um, uh, residence permit issues, mm -hmm. yeah. Tata, um, I'm sorry, that I'm sorry. Uh, yes, yeah, we I will try to finish time. it. Yeah. yeah, so uh, because of this, they, they had serious problems during COVID-19 uh, and residence permit uh, politics was further tightened, we can say. But to me, compared to Tbilisi, was less strict with governmental restrictions. And therefore, because of this, um, different migrants groups in, uh, moved to Batumi during the pandemic. Uh, the crisis had a different impact on different groups of migrants, as I have mentioned. The most vulnerable were migrants from developing countries, from Asian countries, from Africa, and also with a lower income uh, and uh, limited resources. Uh, among the uh, respondents were citizens of, yeah, like I can mention that the most vulnerable group is Asian and African citizens. Uh, immigrants from developed countries felt less negative consequences of the pandemic in Georgia, and many of them considered it safer to stay in Georgia during the first wave, and they didn't return to their homeland countries. So thank you very much for your attention and sorry for uh, uh, extending no, it's my okay. presentation.
Um, yeah, thanks so much to all participants. And uh, uh, yeah, we still have some time for, for our discussion, discussion session. Uh, yeah, uh, I would like to ask our audience to raise their hand if they have a question or just type it in the chat. So uh, I think it's better if I read out uh, if, any, if there are any questions to, uh, in, in, in the chat. So uh, yeah, the audience, the floor is yours now. Um, uh, uh, yeah, um, all right, so if, uh, uh, I mean, if there are uh, no questions from the audience, I will use this time for my kind of my discretion as a, as a moderator uh, to ask one question per, to, to, to kind of each of the participants. Uh, to uh, Professor Tsumaya, I would ask, um, uh, how would you see that the kind of uh, the discourses uh, uh, towards migrants uh, kind of uh, developing over time? I assume that you you also also had uh, uh, at least kind of looked at the discourses in previous times and how it kind of, whether there are like any temporal changes in the uh, in in uh, in these. Um, and actually, uh, for to Professor Pritzhalau, I would ask that: uh, uh, How would you see the? Um, I mean, uh, when looking at like Georgian migrants and like how Georgian migrants see themselves in these new environments, um, do you would you see like uh, any differentiation between the background of the migrants because there are people from like coming from outside BSC or like having different education and time and so on and so forth. And uh, to, Tat uh, to, to Tatiana, I would ask uh, whether you would had uh, a chance to look at uh, uh, things, how things have changed after the after Russia's war uh, against Ukraine, because we see a lot of people coming to Georgia kind of fleeing the war, both from Russia and Ukraine, and as well as Belarus. So yeah, thanks so much. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, actually, it was so fascinating and interesting to listen to a presentation of colleagues because uh, now, uh, to me, it was more clear, right? I mean, these were two, again, uh, you know, types of uh, coverage that I was actually monitoring, right? I mean, uh, those uh, people, Medea story, again, those who actually went to Germany and those who came to Georgia, although they were Asians and mostly African origins and did not turn to Christians, right? I mean, like, like Abo, for example, or like Ukraine's who are Orthodox Christians, like Georgians, and that, that makes a, a whole difference, right? But also I want to um, answer your uh, question, Dato. I think there is no much change about it, okay? So Georgia remains a migrant uh, country. So we are more interested in our own people, those who actually uh, go abroad and we want them back, or, you know, we are interested, our media is interested in their, their stories mostly. And uh, I don't know, because we are less tolerant, probably we are less interested in to hear immigrant stories, especially those who are, you know, different from us, okay, especially who are vulnerable, who are coming from, uh, you know, different um, countries that, that are not, uh, uh, you know, that does not have common uh, cultural values with us. So I think this has not been changed a lot uh, for years, although I don't have a specific uh, uh, studies to, to, to compare, okay, you know, what was previously or, before, but I mean, I still, I still think that, you know, uh, you know, Georgian media is very much interested to their own, uh, you know, culture, okay, their own identity identity rather than other's identity. So, but I mean, I, I hope, I, I can always speculate now, I, I hope that this is changing, okay, with Ukrainian uh, migrants, because, you know, uh, 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 to me, it was very noticeable 
this this change, right? Everyone, everybody. I mean, uh, in my bubble, definitely, right? I mean, we are like very very open uh, to um, actually support Ukrainian migrants. So th that that would be my uh, answer. Yeah, and even you know, maybe I will add one thing, you know, because you know, it was co connected to Tatiana's. Um, research about uh, COVID, uh, COVID related uh, coverage. I have also looked into how COVID has changed the coverage of migration and nothing has changed as well. Okay, it was same emigrant oriented coverage, although as Tatiana mentioned that there was a bigger flow from uh, of migrants coming to Georgia or, or staying here as labor migrants, but no stories about them, no no voice uh, voices heard about them. So that means that you know Georgian media is still very, I mean it has a narrow, uh, very focused uh, uh, scene that uh, they are interested. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for interesting comment about my migrants who are living in Germany. Yes, there is differences, of course, but uh, there is more differences uh, uh, when uh, uh, when they are born. It's Soviet period or post-Soviet period. Uh, in Germany, it's important all of them, uh, educated or not educated, are working. Uh, they are legal and they are working. But uh, very interesting for me was this. Does not matter. They are born in Soviet period as me or later younger people, the attitudes to Georgia uh, about that in Georgia is uh, like a very poor life. They could not uh, you uh, get back and live. It's still the same uh, from both uh, generation, I mean. Yeah, and uh, the, it's, uh, I underline this because I had the previous different uh, study about Georgians who are abroad. Uh, in Germany, is uh, absolutely different because of education policy, what uh, has Germany. And all uh, of them, uh, they are um, legalized, uh, uh, are living as legal. They are uh, all uh, paying taxis and everything. It's different in France. It's different in Portugal. But, but was very interesting. Thank you very much for your question. <clears throat> uh, so first of all, before I answer David's question, I want to clarify something. Yeah. So when I mentioned that in 2020, net migration balance was positive and immigrants for the first time exceeded immigrants number. Yes, this is a statistical number, but we should take into consideration that Georgian Statistical Office uh, also includes in immigrants Georgian citizens. And this yeah. was, of course, for that reason why it exceeded, not because of more em uh, immigrants like foreigners uh, entered country and uh, more labor migrants among them. Now, uh, answering David's uh, question about uh, the um, uh, recent uh, geopol geopolitical changes and uh, Russia-Ukrainian war and uh, the impact on Georgia, we know that uh, after February, the number of Russians, Ukrainians and Belarusians are um, uh, growing a lot and it's very easy first of all it's very li liberate uh, we have very liberate um, you know, politics because they can stay here for one year they don't need any visa for entering the country also it's very easy for them to integrate because they uh, i don't know uh, among other groups when we were comparing for example with asian groups or others it's much easier for them to integrate into georgian society and mostly they choose Tbilisi or Batumi. If we look at the real estate in 2022, so Russians are, Russian citizens are leaders uh, by owning and buying real estate in Tbilisi as well as in Batumi. And in Tbilisi, they choose, uh, I, I can even show you the map. I don't know why I made this map. <laughs> if it's, if we have time, uh, how they choose the, um, uh, how they choose the uh, districts and where they uh, buy mostly their property. So uh, on, as I have mentioned, the first, uh, the first 
I would like to show you. I'm trying to open it. Yeah, so I'm sorry for uh, technical issues. Yeah, I have opened it and I, I hope that I can show you. This is the first map and it shows the, uh, this actually shows the quantity of uh, real estate objects that are owned by foreigners. And you see that most, most intensively they buy like Sabrutalo, Vake, these are for the like most popular uh, districts where they buy apartments. Uh, and then you see, but then you see that, they, that uh, all foreigners buy in different uh, districts, but most popular are of course central ones. And now I can show you the second map that includes the nationalities of the uh oh my god sorry yeah i can yeah i can show you now i think this is the second map and it actually uh 2022 this are recent uh this is recent data and it shows the um real estate or like real estate location in different districts of Tbilisi and nationalities. I have it in Georgia, uh, in Georgian language. I couldn't translate it because I was not expecting to show this map, but you see that mostly Russian group is leading in all the districts. Only probably Sabrutalo is the only district where Iranians have the most uh, uh, most uh, real estate uh, objects uh, and they own them. But, but Russian group is um, presented in all Georgian, uh, in, old Pilis, in old Pilisi districts. And also you can see the other groups of migrants who buy properties here. So, yeah. Uh, thank you so much. It's uh, yeah, said for your comprehensive answers to, to my questions. Uh, I, I kind of perhaps I asked a little bit of noob questions, so to say. Um, but I mean, it, yeah, I really enjoyed listening to this panel, despite the fact that we were a little bit over time. But uh, hopefully, our participants also uh, did so. But uh, and our audience members and uh, yeah, let me with this wrap up the, our uh, panel and uh, uh, in 25 minutes we'll have our final uh, panel on methodological innovations for academic and policy research. I would uh, uh, I would ask everyone to stay tuned because we have three excellent presentations, uh, very, uh, very interesting presentations and. Uh, yeah, uh, hopefully uh, uh, we can see, we'll see all of you there as well. So thanks again to our participants, to our audience Thank members, you. and uh, see you in half an hour, in 25 minutes. Thank, Thank you. you. Una vez ver... Hello. Hello. Kova, uh, nice to finally virtually meet you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> nice to meet you too. <laughs> How are you doing? Okay, okay. I was uh I was expecting Jesse to give this talk, so I'm uh hopefully I will not let you down. <laughs> Great, wonderful. So we are back to our conference final session. Uh, and we will be talking about methodological innovations uh, for academic and policy research. Three exciting presentations about experimental research, two from Armenia, one from Georgia, um, and looking forward to those presentations. So we'll have three presentations, 15 minutes each, and again, 15 minutes for 
uh, overall question and answer sessions. So first, uh, first presentation by Jonathan Cavalry and uh, Jesse Dylan Savage. Uh, Jonathan is here. Jesse is Jesse here too? But or, or no, unfortunately, you... he has okay. another conference commitment. This is the okay. one time he couldn't make it. Okay, okay, fine. And then uh, we'll have another presentation by our colleague from Armenia, Sona Palasanian, and her colleagues. And finally, our colleague from here, Sierra C, Georgia, Dustin Gilbert, give, give uh, the presentation about um, HIV testing in Georgia. So without further ado, we are a little bit uh, over time. So let's, why well, won't uh, lose any, any more time for this introduction. And Jonathan, please. Uh, the floor is yours and 15 minutes for your presentation. Thank you so much, Koba. Um, can you everyone see my presentation? Yes. Okay, terrific. So um, the good news about this method I'll be presenting today is uh, it takes very complicated things and makes them quite simple. That's sort of the virtue of conjoint analysis. So I won't need my full 15 minutes. Um, so first thing, my name is John Caverly. I work for the United States Naval War College, which means um, this. Is, these are my own research opinions. They don't represent those of the college, the United States Navy, or the United States government. I have to say that every time I present my research. And this is, of course, done in uh, tandem with my uh, beloved colleague, Jesse Dillon Savage at Trinity College Dublin. Um, I just want to thank, first of all, CRC for the opportunity to present this research, but more importantly, for their immense help in making this survey possible. I have just, it's been a joy to work with you all, and um, I'm very grateful um, for the creativity and the feedback you gave as we uh, developed the survey instrument and the survey methodology. And uh, we could not have done this without you. So thank you so much. Um, in case you're wondering, this is a picture of the Kentucky State National Guard from the United States training Armenian soldiers. Uh, this is primarily what we were researching, what, what happens when you provide military training to other countries, what are its effects on politics? Um, so basically the research question is very simple. Um, we expanded from military training to a larger sense of human capital. So the international sources of human capital um, in a globalized world, uh, many people re receive human capital from outside their home country and bring it back in. Um, this obviously is likely to have an effect on politics. And so we wanted to use a survey to figure out, to start figuring out what those effects might be and comparing the various um, options for human capital. Um, there's a lot of research on this. Uh, probably the most famous is Joe Nye's idea of soft power and how education in particular can be a means of countries um, achieving soft power with other countries. Um, lots of work on military training and education. Uh, we started uh, this when we started looking at American training of foreign militaries and how it correlates to coups. Um, and that's because generally when you supply military human capital in a undercapitalized country, you're likely to see the military play a bigger political effect. We want to expand that inquiry um, to uh, possible positive and negative effects of various sources of human capital. Um, so basically, education in particular is supposed to make uh, individuals um, more have higher human capital. They should be more economically productive, more socially uh, uh, accomplished, and so they should be more attractive. Um, and we just assumed this would happen for um, politics as well. So if you wanna talk about soft power, um, then you wanna look at the effect of this international addition of human capital to domestic politics. Um, and so we wanted to think of all the different ways, stylized ways you can add human capital from abroad. And again, even though we're focused on the international addition, uh, the nice thing about working with CRC in Armenia is we're looking at the domestic effects, right? This isn't some sort of, neo-colonial enterprise, we are actually looking at the individuals inside the country as agents to figure out what they want, what they appreciate, what they find valuable and attractive about external sources of human capital. Okay, so for obvious reasons, there's lots of different ways to achieve education and training, this human capital. So it's a multi-dimensional problem. Um, there's likely to be interactions between the type of training you get and the source. So we think it matters whether you've got uh, a master's degree from Russia or the United States. Um, and therefore we're using a conjoint analysis. Um, this allows us to vary lots of different things within a certain amount. Um, you don't wanna to go too crazy with this um, and see the various interactions and 
and find some causal causal links. Okay, so we uh, used the nationally in-person representative sample in Armenia at the end of last year. It was at 1,252 respondents. And what we did was we gave uh, each respondent 15, a choice between two paired candidates 15 times uh, for what we call the deputy prime minister position. And these are block randomized. So everyone got 15. That's about the limit you can give people before they get tired. Um, and then we asked them to do a pairwise uh, uh, comparison and choose one of their preferred candidates. Sort of like going to the eye doctor when you give them two things, like better like this or better like that. And you ask that 15 times. Okay, so here are the main results. They're pretty plausible and intuitive. Uh, basically, if you're on the, the, the AMC, if you're on the right-hand side, you have a positive effect. On your left-hand side, you have a negative effect. Um, if you look at what their primary job was, it doesn't seem to have much of an effect. Um, you do see, in terms of education, you do see some significant differences. So, for example, getting a master's from the United States uh, makes a candidate significantly more attracted to respondents compared to um, getting a master's degree in Armenia, which is the reference value. Um, whereas getting a master's degree in Russia and France are valued less than getting your master's in Armenia. Um, this finding surprised us. If you look at sort of international experience, uh, we had two different variables here, whether it was working for an international organization or working in the private sector. Uh, either way, this international experience was valued regardless of whether you did it in Russia or uh, the United States. Uh, so in a sense, international kind of professional experience is, uh, is valued considerably um, relative to education. Uh, in general, we wanted to get an interaction effect, so I won't get into it, but basically, uh, when a candidate announced they were going to be responsible for international affairs and security, they were more popular with the respondents than if they said they were responsible for domestic reforms. And I think that's probably just a reflection of the politics of Armenia at the time. I think a lot of politicians have been promising domestic reforms and, uh, and the citizens of Armenia have, are frustrated. Um, and obviously, international affairs and security are very, uh, a very salient topic um, for Armenians these days. Now, the final one, the purple, is uh, military experience. And one thing I want to point out here is we chose for this reference point as no military experience. So basically, any military experience was highly valued. But what I want to point out here is that if you actually use just plain military service as the reference, um, if you get extensive training abroad, you are less valued, right? So, it's, Or if you did a peacekeeping mission abroad, you were less appreciated as a candidate for deputy prime minister than other uh, than your rivals, which I think is very interesting and sort of counterintuitive um, to what we thought going in. This is just another way to think about uh, the results. This is not a, a causal argument. These are just the marginal means. Um, we can go over in the Q and A, um, but again, as you you can see here, um, there's a very big difference. Uh, between whether you served as a veteran and whether you got training abroad. Um, and people largely prefer the one who got training abroad. Um, if you split it by whether you're responsible for domestic reforms or international affairs and security, there are not big differences. So the things that people appreciated for someone who's going to be responsible for security are the same, largely the same for people who are going to do domestic politics, which we found interesting and counterintuitive. And then we also looked at what profession they had. As you can see, um, military officers were not as appreciated uh, as uh, other types. But if you look at the sort of civilian, uh, the interaction of our factors with the civilian uh, professions like business, civil service, and parliament, you see the effects are largely similar. All right, so there's just a big difference how people thought human capital mattered for a military officer versus uh, the non-military professions. Okay, so. There are mixed empirical results. Um, I think there's a lot of variation here to think more uh, thoroughly about. Um, one thing Jesse and I are worried about is does it does the context matter? I mean, if we did this survey before the war um, in the Corner of Karbakh, would that would that have changed? We suspect it it would. Um, what is context specific about Armenia versus other countries? Obviously, we think that is the case. Um, and so obviously we would like to work uh, with CRC and uh, other survey partners to uh, expand the, the number of states we look into and have a more fine-grained idea of what 
uh, what is it about a master's degree? What is it about professional experience that people value? Um, with that, I'll conclude. I look forward to your questions and thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, present this uh, work in progress. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. That's uh, very interesting. And the beauty of the method that you presented is that you can, you can explain very complex things or show in a very uh, relatively simple way. Of course, uh, you don't, cannot have answers to everything, but um, with other methods that will take much longer and much more nuances to uh, talk about, to convey the same conclusions and same message. Thank you. Um, and I'm sure there will be questions and uh, clarification questions during the discussion or additions to your uh, conclusions and we yeah, are looking forward to that. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, we have another presentation um, by our dear colleague Sona and colleagues from CRRC Armenia and Sona, please go ahead. Hello, hi everyone. We had hard times uh, figuring out which one of the researchers to pick up to show some methodological um, methodological innovation. And we, in the end, uh, decided to talk about um, a randomized control trial that we conducted with IFPRI, that is International Food Policy Research Institute, um, and World Food Program. And because our panel today is also uh, is about both uh, policy informing research and academic research, this is a good example of, of a research that had um, both outcomes. So a paper, an academic one, was was presented to IFPRI. That is, and here is the IFPRI discussion paper, and it was co-authored by Heather Knauer, uh, Elmira Bakshinyan, and Harold Alderman. All of these people co-authored this paper, and I'm just presenting today the research to you. Uh, and I, I also co-authored it, but other authors are not present here. Um, and we worked together on this on this project, um, trying to find out uh, how we could promote school readiness through a preschool feeding program. Basically, we were looking to uh, a randomized control trial into a possibility of a nutritional nudge to improve at-risk preschoolers' cognitive development in Armenia. Whoever is interested in the paper, you can find the paper, it's open, it's on IFPRI's um, web page, so if you just um, search for IFPRI Armenia World Food Program, you will find this uh, paper. Um, the paper is more, as I said, academic, and the conclusion uh, for this paper was that the nutritional nudge was important for preschoolers who had socioeconomic disadvantage. Um, so the study found positive effects of adding a morning snack to a school lunch program on the fluid intelligence of pre preschoolers from households with lower, lower socioeconomic status. Um, to move forward, to give you some insights on the research design, I will now share um, our presentation. Just a second. Yes. Um, so to, to dive a little bit deeper into the research um, design, the purpose for this research was to, overall purpose, was to enhance the impact of school feeding on learning. And objective was to assess a potential role for school snacks in preschools in enhancing the classroom performance of preschool children. We had evaluation questions. How much of the improvement, improvement of children's cognitive and non-cognitive skill development can be attributed to our intervention, which was a, which was a breakfast, healthy, healthy breakfast? Uh, has the intervention resulted in any unintended effects, for example, on some of the cognitive uh, aspects that we were measuring? And what were gender-specific impact, impacts of the intervention? So what we did, we had control group schools uh, and uh, intervention schools. And in the intervention schools, we gave morning snack. And then we, we did a cognitive test to see if this improved cognitive processes of children um, 
And then we, we were monitoring the increased knowledge. So in the control schools, there was no morning snack and there was only lunch at the school. But both uh, groups, subgroups of the, of the schools um, were, were undergoing cognitive testing by a professional group of psychologists. So if we look at the, uh, at the study design, uh, so, so the, the schools were uh, located in three most disadvantaged Marses of Armenia. We had this control and treatment schools, we had short-term assessment, and we had long-term assessment. Short, um, so for, uh, for the schools, we, we had 50 schools in each um, group, treatment, school, treatment schools and control schools and in treatment we had this healthy snack in line with the lunch uh, for short-term follow-up we had tests for fluid intelligence which are internationally recognized tests and we were uh, testing for processing speed memory of children reasoning and then we had long-term follow-up which was already uh, looking at crystallized intelligence uh, so school readiness, vocabulary, verbal fluency, and reasoning. For fluid intelligence, we were looking at, uh, we were using Ve Vexler's preschool and primary scale of intelligence. So basically this was, uh, you see the pictures, it was, uh, it was, children were looking at pictures and trying to find some tendencies, like they had back search, they had a picture memory check, uh, they had matrix reasoning, for example, look at the matrix and find similarities. And they had picture concepts matching some similar pictures to each other. And then for um, then we also measured school readiness to the breaking school readiness, composite knowledge of colors, letters, numbers, and just the instance of using breaking school readiness scores in Armenia was already very important to the country because this was the first time that the, that the test that is internationally recognized was used uh, in the country. Uh, we were looking at household demographics and some parenting indicators. We had also beyond that child parent relationship scale in the, in the questionnaire for parents. Uh, so we were not only doing cognitive tests with the school children, but we also had um, interviews with caregivers of, of children. Uh, in the end, 948 children in 48 schools were um, sampled. And what we found, we had no effect on reported attendance. So the hypothesis was rejected that uh, the snack could uh, improve the attendance in Armenia, although in some other countries it did improve attendance. Uh, we saw an evidence of a hunger gap. And this was a very important finding for us because about 45% of children in control group did not eat breakfast on the day of testing. And in treatment group, 52% of children did not eat breakfast on the day of testing, which meant that we had an overall global problem of breakfast for preschoolers in the country. We found no significant effect on overall breakfast variety, but we found effects on improvement in breakfast quality. Um, we have so evidence of modest effects on fluid intelligence. We had some increased mean scores for uh, treatment schools. Um, we looked at the factors that affected children's intelligence, and this were uh, also related to um, socioeconomic status of parents, um, school quality, um, which was assessed through breaking scores of children, rural urban divide of, uh, between uh, the, the school location whether the child had breakfast before coming to school. Um, we had quartiles of wealth. Um, and, and we all we looked at this in respect to um, fluid intelligence scores. Um, what in the end we found through treatment modifications was that lower uh, household wealth uh, and mother education that was secondary or less was 
significantly associated with children's scores and there was uh, some positive effect of healthy school snack. So in the absence of the intervention, half of children do not eat breakfast before going to school, which meant that intervention per se in general was very important for the country. And, and up to today, working program is still considering this finding for policy, but before it can um, enter into force as a breakfast program, it shall be designed for taking into account what research found and what um, important factors have to be taken into account for Armenia. Uh, we found that this school snack did not replace and should not replace breakfast for treatment uh, children, which meant that some additional educational uh, campaigns shall be done to increase the amount of children in the country who have healthy breakfast before coming to school. Uh, although they can still have the school snack, which can improve their cognitive um, abilities. The program had promising effects on children's cognitive development. And we saw um, some small effect, but we, were, we predicted that the effect could be um, higher in the long term. And so the program had greater effect among disadvantaged children with lower household wealth and mothers with, who completed secondary school or lower, who had secondary school or lower education. For follow-up, we used the, we, we measured the crystallized intelligence and we were still, uh, and we still through, through this follow-up, we confirmed the positive effect of school snack on disadvantaged children, but we did not confirm the hypothesis for mother education. That's why in the academic paper you saw we were arguing for socioeconomic disadvantage um, and not mentioning mother's education in the end. Um, so this is, I think, uh, what I wanted to present here and I think we are on time, even two minutes early. Yes, thank you, Sona. Actually, I, I'm thinking about a new research correlation or even causation between research method and the length of presentation or paper for that matter. And so far it looks like <laughs> <laughs> experiments do a uh, much better job than any other method in terms of uh, uh, succinct and uh, uh, direct um, communication of findings and results. Dusty, let's see if your presentation fits the pattern there. I, I was about to say it will. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I timed it a bit earlier and I think I was at 12 minutes. So I didn't show the one minute video though. So assuming there's no technical problems, then I think we'll probably fit with the correlation so far. So. <laughs> Hi everyone, um, thanks for being here today and thanks for Sona and Jonathan, your really interesting presentation so far. Uh, my name is Dustin Gilbreth and I'm a non-resident senior fellow with CRC Georgia. And today I'm gonna to be talking about a work in progress like many of the presentations at this conference um, about nudging HIV self-testing in Georgia. And in doing so, I'm going to talk briefly um, a bit about background. Afterwards, I'll get into the methodology which we used um, and then go through a pretty big set of findings that will actually not take too much time to present because they're pretty clear in lots of ways. Um, and from there, I'll get into conclusions and next steps because we're actually entering a second phase of the randomized control trial right now. With that said, I do, before I get started, want to thank partners. Um, this project that we're doing this with has far, far too many partners for a, a project. So there's UNDP in Georgia, UNTP um, in Istanbul, UNDP in Czechia is the main donor for the project, for which we are very grateful. Um, and then UNFPA is supporting on some things. Forset helped design the graphics that we'll see. Uh, and a big, big thank you to, in particular, um, Tanit Roma, a great Georgian organization that helps with HIV testing. And I feel like I'm forgetting one or two more partners, but I just want to say thanks to all of those who may be watching. And I'm very sorry if I forgot to mention you. So with that out of the way, 
In Georgia, HIV testing and HIV is heavily, heavily stigmatized. The general association in the public, um, at least in the expert view, is that it's associated with LGBT people and drug users and intravenous drug users in particular. This is something that <clears throat> follows sort of global patterns and associations. Um, and this is why these two populations tend to be considered key populations. I, I guess I should specify not LGBT population specifically, but more specifically men who have sex with men, which does include heterosexual men and non-heterosexual men. So with this, Georgia actually is doing pretty good when it comes to the UN AIDS 90-90-90 goals. Um, and these goals are basically making sure that people have treatment if they know they have HIV and things like this. But the key exception is actually the final goal that most people with HIV actually know that they have it. Um, and most people living with AIDS know that they have it. So the estimates um, from the National Center of Disease Control suggest that up to 40% of the population that is living with HIV does not know that they have it actually. With this, we're also seeing increasing reports of young heterosexuals um, who are not intravenous drug users, um, not people who, not men who have sex with men, um, actually getting HIV. And so it's outside of your traditional young key populations is what we're seeing in Georgia increasingly. So knowing this and trying to work towards that third UN AIDS goal, we went in partnership with lots of people, as I mentioned previously. And what we're doing is we, we helped, we took an existing platform, selftest.ge, um, and then we ordered a lot of HIV self-tests. We trained a large group of peer advisors and doctors in sensitive service provision, which is something that was a key barrier identified by a lot of qualitative research in trying to actually get an HIV self-test um, and actually going to get HIV self-test fears about doctors not respecting confidentiality, not respecting young people. Um, then we set up a hotline where self-test users can gain support and using the platform um, Selftest.g. They can also get support from those doctors um, and peer advisors on how to use the self-test on basically lots of different things there, um, uh, interpreting the self-tests and so on and so forth. And finally, we conducted a randomized advertising campaign or a randomized control trial on Facebook in order to attempt to get users to order self-tests. And so with this, we tried out four different messages. Oh, this is the one partner I forgot. So we developed these messages in partnership with the Nudge Unit or the Behavioral Insights Team in a previous project. Um, and this is sort of the follow-up. So thank you to the Nudge Unit. Um, these four messages basically focus on four key themes that came up in qualitative research. So the first is a control message. It's just saying it's quick and easy to get a self-test order here. The second message, is trying to assuage fears of a positive result and try and say to people, you know, if you catch HIV early enough, if you catch AIDS early enough, you can actually live a pretty normal life. The third one focuses on confidentiality, basically trying to say to people, we have a special set of doctors, they're not gonna tell everyone that you went and got an HIV self-test and we actually, you don't even need to give your name to get this self-test. And finally, we, had one message and it's true, we haven't given out the iPhone yet, but we are running a lottery where one person who orders an HIV self-test will actually get a iPhone 13 sometime in the next month actually, um, just for potentially ordering. And so just to show, here's the baseline message. So do you know your HIV status? A UN initiative in Georgia enables young people aged 18 to 34 to get tested free of charge. Click on this link, fill out a simple form, and an HIV test will be delivered to you free of charge. The HIV tests are quick and easy to use. Inside the package, you'll find an HIV self-test instructions on how to use it and where you can find out more information about the results. The fear of positive result message has all that same information, but then we add that many people think that HIV is only a problem for men who have sex with men and drug users, but recent research shows that more people getting HIV in Georgia are heterosexuals. With modern medicine and early detection, HIV is completely treatable. You can live a completely normal life and the risk of passing the virus on to anyone else is minimal. Through this link, you can reach trained professionals that are sensitive to the needs of young people and are available to help you use the self-test and understand the results. 
The next treatment about confidentiality, same information as the treatment message or the control message rather, but adding in that it's completely confidential um, and anonymous. And also the tests in a discrete package. So no one knows what's inside, including the person delivering it. And you don't even need to provide your name to meet with a doctor or one of these sensitive um, professionals. All you need to do is fill out this simple form. The third one, pretty simple and straightforward. You'll be entered to you'll be entered into a lottery draw to win a new iPhone 13. All you need to do is take this simple form and take a test. So just briefly, I'm going to show you what Forset came up with and the control message, which in turn appeared on Facebook um, whenever we actually launched this randomized control trial. So So that's what we had for the control message. The subsequent treatment messages appeared on Facebook um, and as well as the control message, obviously. Um, and we used Facebook's A-B testing tool to actually measure which message was performing best. And then we also had the internal self-test.g tracking system to see which groups of people were actually ordering self-tests. Overall, the sample that we had is quite large. So we had 47,908 um, study participants. And so Overall, we estimate that this is about 20% of the Facebook population that is in our target age range, which included people of 18 to 35 years of age in Kutaisi, Batumi, and Tbilisi. So with this, that's actually 17% of the overall target population in the entire country, including those people who don't use Facebook. So in this regard, we're relatively confident that there's a fair amount of external validity with approximately one fifth of the target population participating in the study. So what did we find? Overall, um, uh, actually, I guess some target statistics just before, or some summary statistics just before hopping into the findings. So overall, this is the breakdown in the first column of the number of viewers. So that 47,908 number, there was a bit more um, people who saw treatment number one actually, um, and then, Treatment number two got a bit less and treatment number three a little bit less, so more. And we look at the number of times that respondents saw it, it varies by message between about six and seven and a half times. Um, but over and all, we get about 6.7 um, times that one person sees this message um, in total. And to get this sample size, our total ad spend was about $463. So it's about $115, pretty equal for each group. So with this, the first metric that we actually get from all of this is what the click-through per user was. So if someone saw the advertisement, what was the chance that they actually clicked through to try and get a self-test? The control message actually performed um, pretty well. So it was at 29% of the people inside of that message or inside of that treatment group actually went and clicked through. By comparison, the message about assuaging fears did pretty badly actually. So it did six percentage points equivalent to maybe uh, a few thousand people or so less actually clicked through to that advertisement and clicked through to try and order a self-test um, if they saw that message about fear um, or trying to assuage their fears. Then for the treatment about confidentiality, 
It did perform slightly better than the control, so two percentage points. Uh, this is a statistically significant difference, um, but that in the current context, um, statistically significant isn't really all that important because the sample size is almost 50,000 and everything's statistically significant. With this, um, the third message though, the iPhone lottery, sort of unsurprisingly did the best. And we got 38 percentage point click through on that. So that outperformed the control message by nine percentage points. With this though, we got lots of impressions inside of that final group. Um, so people who saw the iPhone message saw it lots of times um, and people in other groups saw it a few less times, right? And so when we adjust for that, we still actually see that the second treatment and the third treatment are actually performing quite effectively. They're doing better than the control and definitely doing way better than the assuaging fears, but they're not doing quite as beautifully as the summary statistics on the previous slide suggested. When it comes to the cost um, per click, so of actually advertising this and getting it in front of people, um, we see that the fourth message is actually the winner. So it costs about 2.0.2, so 2.92 cents in US dollars um, to get one click um, for the third advertisement. So with the iPhone lottery, by comparison in the control group, it was 3.23 cents. Again, same sort of finding, it's more expensive, um, just like less people want to click with the assuaging fears treatment. So 3.75 cents, that's a pretty substantial gap. Treatment two is quite similar, though slightly cheaper than the control for this one. So in this regard, the clear winner is again, the iPhone lottery on this statistic. But what do we actually want people to do? We want people to order the HIV self-tests. So as I've mentioned before, 50,000 people or so saw this, the service is entirely free someone, a Glovo driver, or will even deliver the self-test to your door. Um, and despite this, we got for this one month advertising period, a total of nine self-test orders. Um, and so with this, the control group actually performed the best. Um, and so they got six orders. I'm sort of suspicious of that to a certain degree, just because this group was also part of the young key population generally. So most of the orders in the first group were from either intravenous drug users or men who have sex with men. But um, as far as I can tell from sort of checking with partners, no one really shared the link as far as we can tell. Um, on top of that, in terms of link sharing, we would expect that the third treatment would actually be the one that people would wanna share with their friends. And so, Maybe it's random chance, um, I'm not sure entirely. So the control message appears to be doing better in terms of actually getting the desired behavior. And we convert this to basically conversion cost, a metric that's pretty common in business. How much in advertising do we have to get to get one order? Um, we see that again, so the control group really outperforms by a measure of six to one or three to one um, as the last chart would imply. So thank you very much for your attention. Just in conclusions, um, what we see from this data so far is that the lottery seems like it's working for clicks, but we're having a lot of trouble actually getting people to order um, a self-test. And so with this, when we generally see the average length of time for once someone clicks through is about three seconds. And so it seems like they get to the website and they see that they have to fill out a registration form and they say, uh, I don't feel like it. And so that's sort of what we're wondering about right now. A second reflection on this data is that the attempt to assuage fears of possible results is definitely failing. There's two possible causal pathways and we're gonna do a little bit of qualitative follow-up with different people to think a bit more about this, but the ones that come to mind are that it just makes people feel comfortable and think, well, if it's treatable, it's not that bad, right? Maybe it induces greater fear and indecision. And another option is that maybe just the reference to men having sex with men might be turning people off to this advertisement, so to speak. With this, the, the driver of actual behavior, if we assume that the above results are clean and good, 
the basic control message, which is simple, short, sweet, it seems to be driving the behavior that's wanted most. So with this, we're sort of refining the messages slightly um, and have actually launched that next phase of the randomized control trial. And then afterwards, we'll be doing a little bit of qualitative to dig into these findings further. Um, so with that, thank you for your attention and I'll end there. So thanks. Thanks, Dustin. Yes, as predicted, it follows the pattern a uh, little bit shorter than uh, the target was. Thank you. We, we, we had uh, three excellent uh, pre presentations on very different topics, uh, similar methods somewhat, and uh, very interesting findings. So I'm sure there will be um, questions and comments and discussion around those uh, presentations. Uh, either you should raise your hand or type it here and I will read out. Before people do that, uh, let me use this opportunity to ask one question uh, to Z Sona. Um, uh, I, I, I ask often my friend about, you know, uh, significant correlates of um, academic performance for children. He's an education specialist and he tells me, he likes jokes and I don't know whether it's a joke or he really believes that. He says it all goes gets down to genetics and social economic status of uh, uh, of the family. Everything else is a joke. Uh, so I don't know whether it's a joke or he really means that. But anyways, um, uh, if, if, where did, what you measured? Uh, uh, I was wondering whether um, whether it was too too soon or too quick uh, to to have some results in uh, academic performance because I mean, good, good, good lunch for pretty much hungry kids will not make them immediately uh, more diligent or, or smarter for that matter or, or, or you name it. So well, what do you think about that was, was timing? Uh, I mean, time gap between the tests uh, um, long enough to see some results. Yeah, thank you, Koba, for this question. And this was a question of the research team as well. We had six months in between uh, the first, uh, first assessment and then the follow-up. Um, and we think that if we had more time, we could see more effects. But even within this short period of time for the fluid intelligence, we could see significant effects on so, so uh, for children with a lower socioeconomic status and for children who had mothers with lower education. Uh, and so if we could see this too, we could already have uh, some uh, understanding on the positive effects of the, of the healthy school snack on, on children's cognitive um, development. Uh, but we had that um, conversations, and of course, we would expect to see more if we had a longer time frame between the follow-ups. But that, of course, is linked to logistical issues. You cannot uh, run the project for years, and you have to make quick decisions in terms of policy. And you, we also had measures of height and weight to see if the snack somehow changed the overall pattern for the treatment schools. But that, I think we did not find any, any effect because of the limited, limited time. And that's why it's not, basically it's not reported, but we had that in the field, in field work, um, but we, we should expect to see more if we had more time. But our conclusion was that if in this short period of time we see an effect on socioeconomic advantage and we see a linkage with mother's education, then we could expect to see more. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's, yeah, excellent, uh, excellent uh, research. But it's 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 strange to argue that you need to feed people because it will improve academic performance. Otherwise you, you don't have to do that. But uh, of course, <laughs> that's what- so that's It did what improve. It did improve academic performance right, for right, right. children but, yeah. with what, what I'm who saying have is lower that we, socioeconomic status. 
yeah, well, I mean, yeah, that's yeah, that's that's great. But uh, uh, let's say if you did not improve, does it mean that you should not provide children with snacks? Of course yeah, not. That, of <laughs> course not. That's yet another conclusion. And and the finding on that overall, more than half of children in both groups be that control or treatment, did not have breakfast before coming yeah. to school. Yeah. That was a very important finding in itself. Mm -hmm. And that directly went into uh, World Value, uh, into uh, World Food Program's um, agenda for educating parents for healthy, or for providing healthy breakfast for children in the morning. Thanks, Sora. Great, thank you. Uh, Jonathan has a uh, uh, question, I suppose. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, First of all, thank you for those two presentations that followed ours. I, it was very interesting. And I think it really shows kind of the range of what you can do with experimental methods. And, and Sona, just like a classic physical intervention, large scale, um, really, really powerful way of investigating. And then I'm sort of in the middle. And then Dustin and his team's work is, is on the other end. And so because a lot of social scientists, because we don't have a lot of money, <laughs> We, we tend to try and go in the direction that, that Dustin and I are going. Um, I actually wanted to talk, uh, have a question to Dustin about his work. Um, so your presentation was a bit of a roller coaster. It was very excited with your uh, statistically significant differences with a massive sample. And then nobody ordered the tests, which is really <laughs> depressing. So um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, because again, like we want to convert our links to an action that involves people to invest a little bit of their time and attention to do something that we care about. Um, and obviously, I think you have so few people actually ordering the test that you probably have no, there's probably actually no difference in kind of outcomes, given the massive number of people you surveyed. Um, I'm wondering what you think is the, if you're going to do the next phase of this factor to see what gets you between the initial click and the ordering, what are the what are the covariates to that? So it's not just like no one wants to fill out the registration, but like, what do you think are the covariates that make people more likely to choose to actually go ahead and fill out the registration and get the test? Thanks. Well, thanks for that one. Yeah, I mean, so right now it's disproportionately people in key populations. Um, and so I, I think that <clears throat> probably risk is one of the key variables. So um, like, I, I don't have the data there because, right, it's like five versus one or something, yeah. right? Um, but basically, like five people who ordered tests are engaged in um, activities that are associated with risk for getting HIV and AIDS. And so I don't think that there's actually a clear enough sort of like risk knowledge inherently in society. And our messages aren't effectively like doing that. So like, I think that like mentioning that, like mentioning like men who have sex with men was probably a terrible choice um, in that second message, just because the level of homophobia in Georgia. Um, I think that there's probably some general societal factors also at play inside of this. Um, and I think that the landing page could be really significantly improved. So for some technical reasons, we have to have a registration system. Um, there's a few legal reasons that we have to have a registration system, even though it doesn't ask for someone's name. Um, but that makes it, I think, a lot harder because I think that basically what's happening is people get to the page and then they see that they have to register and they're saying, I thought this was confidential. This isn't register. Registering is not confidential. I mean, even though we're not collecting personal data, right? So like there's a chat bot there to explain things um, and it connects you to like to a link to like talk to like someone, right? There's a hotline that you can call that's listed there like, so you don't have to give them your phone number. Um, and so I think that that's really the key challenge inside of it is there's, there's a classic sort of lab experiment I remember. I don't remember who wrote it, but basically it was with the dictator game, I think. And the guy basically spent a long, 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 long time convincing the participants. It's really confidential. It's really anonymous. No one knows. I've created this elaborate computer system. Um, and I think people are probably a little paranoid in reality about reputation and other things. So yeah, 
that's sort of my thoughts. I, I don't know if I answered the question well or not, but yeah. Thank you. More questions or comments? Um, if I may, if there are no other questions, I would um, ask a question to John. Um, you mentioned that you are now thinking about the context specific findings of yours in terms of um, how much the context was um, informing the results of the conjoint survey. And I'm sure it did, but how can we also make the context an analytical um, domain for our researchers? Because every research has context. And for example, in Armenia and Georgia, in the context of this um, socioeconomic, sociopolitical shifts, we always have this, this issue of, of external validity and, and context. What are your, um, so, so to say, remedies for, for if, if any, for, for analysis? Um, so my screen froze up a bit, but since we're talking conjoint sana, I assume that question's for me, so I will, I will, I will, I will venture in. Um, so it's a great question. It's the classic problem with experiments. And I think the first message I have is you always have to accept a degree of loss of external validity if you're trying to make your survey internally valid, especially when it's about politics. It's a dilemma. You have to manage it. It's not a puzzle that can be solved. And Americans love to solve puzzles. We don't like managing dilemmas. So this is, um, that's, I mean, that's the first unpleasant message. Um, second, we are still learning how to incorporate pre-treatment variables into the analysis. Um, you know, uh, statistical models that incorporate pre-treatment variables and, um, and, the, and the treatments inside a conjoint um, have a lot of problems with it. Um, so I'm trying to get smarter. I don't think there's actually um, dispositive work on that yet. Um, and then the second solution you can do is you can do a longitudinal sample, um, but you probably can't do a conjoint with the same people. That, uh, a, that's very expensive. B, you're worried about the treatment effects. Um, but I think probably the quick and dirty answer is you have to do it across a few countries and within a country a few times and then just get a qualitative sense of why things might be different and see what lasts over time. That's a very expensive and uh, crude way to control for pretreatment variables, but we've yet to find a, like a statistical within the snapshot uh, method of doing that. I hope that answers your question. It's, the, the, the bottom line sure. is I don't have a good answer to that. Sure, thank you. No, it, it did answer my question, yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, please, Sarah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just a quick question to Dustin uh, regarding his research. Uh, I just wonder whether you have used the same techniques uh, for your four ads uh, in Facebook, because it also may depend on the way how you placed your ads. And maybe you have used different techniques or you have um, targeted different audiences and that's why the results were better. I just wanted to clarify whether you use the same tactics for the all four advertisements. Great, yeah, no, thank we you. used Facebook's A-B testing tool and targeted the same groups. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I don't see any other hand or um, or uh, message here. Just a practical question to Jonathan: Are you thinking about expanding that to Georgia too? Because you know, you co um, context is while well, similar and different in uh, the way that you know social economic uh, conditions pretty similar, but military um, perceptions about the military by different and also uh, history of military actions, pretty different in the two countries. So it could be an interesting comparison in many different ways. And uh, if you are thinking about that. 
Uh, the short answer is yes. So uh, looking forward <laughs> to working with you guys again. Um, again, but it gets back to uh, get back to Sana's question. Um, before we do that, we really want to think exactly what she is pinging us on is how can we actually capture the context a little better than just, you know, comparing Armenia at the end of 2021 to Georgia in the summer 2023. Oof, like how can you really compare those? I mean, you know, maybe, I mean, you'll, I guarantee you'll get differences on how people think about the military and how people think about Russia in particular. Um, yeah. But like, I don't need an experiment to tell you that, right? So um, <laughs> What what to do for research design is really tricky, and I'm looking forward to talking to you, Koba and Sona, and all your colleagues about how to do that a little better. Great, thank you. Um, okay, I, I I think we are uh, exactly uh, 4:30, and uh, time to end the session and the conference. Also, uh, this was wonderful session to end uh, the conference with. Uh, with a uh, lot of thoughts and a lot of um, ideas to you know, think about. Uh, now, uh, for concluding remarks, the floor to Dato, and as the organizer of the conference, he is the best person to conclude the conference. Thank you to everyone, to all participants, to presenters especially, to organizers of the conference, my colleagues, and um, looking forward to meeting you next year now in person, hopefully. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I won't bother our participants, our attendees, like with uh, too long of too long of a speech. Uh, 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 yeah, just I just want to thank you. Uh, first of all, those who. Uh, to our participants who took time applied for the, uh, to participate and uh, also uh, worked um, and worked uh, really hard on their presentations and I, I definitely in, I very much enjoyed all the panels that I was able to attend and I definitely feel that uh, despite the fact that our conference is online and everyone has zoom fatigue and no one wants to attend like and everyone kind of wants to attend conferences like in person we still got very, very quality, um, uh, very quality presentations, and uh, I could see the value of like uh, of uh, online conferences connecting uh, different uh, places and time zones. So, and it's a great opportunity for researchers locally, well, locally to attend these conferences and see what uh, their fellow uh, academics are doing elsewhere. Um, one thing that I, I also want to, of course, a huge uh, to say a huge thanks to uh, to my colleagues who worked really hard to make this happen. Of course, first and foremost, this is Mariam Kobaladze who uh, was responsible with the, basically she was the true organizer in terms of logistics and like emailing everyone and setting up all the meetings. Uh, so I think uh, she, Mariam. Uh, if not Mariam, we couldn't have such a smooth and very well organized, very well scripted conference. Uh, I would like to thank our uh, colleagues, especially Sirsia from Sirsi Armenia, for taking care of organizing the methods panel um, and um, uh, their kind of ongoing support with uh, with the conference. Uh, and as well as I would also extend my thanks to our uh, colleagues in Azerbaijan. Um, uh, so why I actually have one announcement uh, for everyone. So we finally have our regional data set of the Cox's barometer. Uh, we know that there are separate uh, kind of uh, um, separate um, uh, publications of the CRC um, of, 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 of Armenia and Georgia Cox's barometer data sets. But uh, starting from today, we will have the final regional data set that will be available on the coxbarometer.org website for download. The microdata will be allowed, uh, will be available for download, and there will be also an opportunity to do online analysis, too, as we always do with uh, with our Cox's barometer surveys. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's that was kind of that is our uh, big announcement about the Cox's barometer. It's our kind of primary 
kind of uh, flagship product for both uh, for both Armenian and Azerbaijan, no, Armenian and Georgia offices of the of of, of CRCs. And uh, I hope that many more researchers will be using uh, our Cox's barometer uh, data. So we always mention in, in our conference in every other year that we are celebrating the publication of the new wave of the data set. Yeah, and hopefully, yeah, this will continue and we'll have many more waves of the Cox's barometer surveys. Yeah, in short, uh, what we can see is that uh, this conference actually touched upon very, very important themes that issues that uh, um, uh, that um, can, that uh, are important to the countries of the South Caucasus. We looked at the, um, kind of the implications of conflicts on the region and how the echoes of the conflict are heard in different countries, how um, how societies um, and the political and uh, how societies work in, in 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 these countries and how where the politics are kind of sort of developing. And I think what is the merit, especially a huge merit of this conference is that we had a great uh, keynote speaker, uh, um, keynote speech from Professor Nikhatin Klein, who talked about uh, a causal inference. Uh, and uh, these, the current panel on methods, of course, it was excellent. So we always try and we manage to keep up with our goal of uh, spreading the word uh, about methodological innovations in social sciences in, and uh, uh, in, in kind of more in, in so social sciences and uh, policy research. So hopefully uh, we will have even more presentations for our next um, a conference on this topic uh, and we will also expect more kind of uh, not only like uh, uh, methodological contributions as well as substantive contributions uh, on the data sets from the region and outside of the region. With this I just want to uh, say again thank you to everyone who uh, took their time and attended our conference uh, and uh, as Goba said um, I we hopefully will welcome you next year in person uh, uh, in Tbilisi uh, for the for our uh, eighth uh, CRC eighth ninth annual methodological conference and we'll, I hope that we'll have even more optimistic title uh, to the conference. Uh, thank you everyone and uh, uh, hopefully we'll see you in person uh, in one year's time.